Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining the Association of Black Cardiologists for our program, Cardiovascular Disease in the Era of COVID-19 and the Future. I would like to thank the National Black Nurses Association for having us as part of their conference this year. We are very excited to be here. I'm Dr. Keith C. Ferdinand, the Gerald S. Berenson Endowed Chair in Preventive Cardiology and Professor of Medicine at the Tulane University School of Medicine and also chair of the Association of Black Cardiologists Access Initiative. I will be the chair and moderator for today's program. As you know, this is a CME program and the Ohio Nurses Association is the provider for this year's educational program. The criteria for successful completion is as follows. Attendance is required for the entire session and contact hours will be awarded commensurate with attendance. This will be awarded based on the evidence of attendance via returned session and conference evaluations. All participants will be required to complete an evaluation form. The login code for this session is F40, F40. We will announce the log out code at the conclusion of our program. Please note, we will have a discussion with the entire faculty at the end of all presentations. Feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A box throughout the program, and they will be addressed at that time. Let's get started. Our first presentation will be Dr. Carol Watson. She's professor of medicine, the co-director of the UCLA program in preventive cardiology, director of the UCLA Barbara Streisand's Women's Heart Health Program, director of the Cardiovascular Medicine Fellowship at the UCLA David Geffen School of Nursing. Dr. Watson will discuss lipid lowering in high-risk patients with a focus on Black women. Thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. And thank you so much, Dr. Ferdinand, for that very kind introduction. I'd like to talk to you about lipid lowering in the high-risk patient, and we're gonna focus on black women. We see that cardiovascular mortality rates are decreasing in the society, but despite that, disparities persist. As you see here, African-Americans still have the highest rates of cardiovascular mortality of any major race ethnic group. And that means that there is still a mortality gap between blacks and whites in terms of cardiovascular mortality, and that's not changing. We've also seen an increase in heart disease and heart disease mortality rates in women, even young women. As you see here in the sort of orange bar, there's an increase in heart attacks amongst women under the age of 30 that is unexplained, but we're going the wrong direction in a lot of ways. Even more shocking is some of our most vulnerable young women, pregnant women, are suffering more myocardial infarctions. This is data from a national database of over 46 million pregnant women who had pregnancy-related hospitalizations they found that mortality and morbidity was highest among Blacks, as you see here. Women have worse outcomes whenever they present with cardiovascular disease. A lot of that stems from the risk factor burden. There's more diabetes, more inflammatory disease like lupus and arthritis, more psychosocial stressors, what I call the SAD risk factors, stress, anxiety, and depression. Those are more common in women. When women present, they usually have chest pain as some component of their presentation, but it may not be the most important. They might say, I am short of breath, or I have jaw pain, or abdominal pain, or fatigue, or palpitations, maybe something else. And for that reason, it takes longer for women to get diagnosed. The way we manage women sometimes is different. They're less likely to have primary PCI or revascularization and they're less likely to receive guideline-directed medical therapy. So not surprisingly, women have higher rates of all-cause mortality after myocardial infarctions. Now, we need to figure out how to lower risk, and much of that stems around risk factor reduction. 
When we think of African Americans, we understand how important a risk factor hypertension is, and we, we absolutely have to keep ringing that bell. But I also want us to focus on lipids. If you look at attributable risk for first MI, lipids are amongst the most important predictors. And this is from the Inner Heart Study and many others. In the Inner Heart Study, they did a case control study of people who had a first myocardial infarction, over 15,000 patients from 52 different countries around the world, including some in Africa. So we see that the same risk factors really are operable in all populations including inadequate intake of fruits and vegetables, smoking, inadequate exercise, unhealthy alcohol patterns, hypertension, diabetes, abdominal obesity, and these psychosocial stressors that I just spoke about. But look at lipids. Most of the impact of attributable risk for first MIs were related to hyperlipidemia. So we have to do something about that. LDL cholesterol, that's the causative agent in atherosclerosis. We know this, and we've seen many studies that show us that lowering LDL decreases events. Look over to the right. These are studies primarily done with statins, and it shows the lower you get the LDL level, the lower the cardiovascular event rate. And when we try to figure out which agents are most effective at lowering risk, Statins rise to the top. This is data from the cholesterol treatment trialist meta-analysis, and it shows that for really all the major cardiovascular outcomes of concern, being on a statin is associated with reduced risk, and that's regardless of what is driving your risk at first. So if it's driven by high cholesterol, clearly being on a statin lowers that risk. If it's driven by low HDL, being on a statin lowers that risk. If it's driven by smoking, being on a statin lowers that risk. For, so being on a statin lowers cardiovascular risk, regardless of what your LDL levels begin at. And it's for that reason that all of our cholesterol um, management guidelines have recommended statin, statin, statin. I was a member of the 2013 Cholesterol Guideline Writing Committee, and we looked at all the available data on ways of lowering LDL cholesterol and their effect on hard cardiovascular outcomes. Statins were the clear winner. Statins lower risk more than any other comparable cholesterol lowering strategy. We know that there's a lot of risk factors that go into cardiovascular risk. And so for our primary prevention patients, we recommended that they assess the risk using this ASCVD risk calculator. So that puts in a number of different risk factors, high cholesterol, low HDL, diabetes or not, smoking or not, hypertension, whether or not they're on treatment, whether or not they're on statin or an aspirin, and race. So this is an example of how that calculator works. If you have a 65-year-old white female with the risk factors as shown below, you put all of those risk factors into the calculator, and it pops out an estimated 10-year risk. Now, the current guidelines ask us to dictate who gets a statin based on that risk. If it's a very low-risk patient, estimated 10-year risk of less than 7.5, really you can go with lifestyle and continue the discussion. But if there's a higher-risk patient, 77.5% estimated risk of a 10-year event or above, we should strongly consider statin therapy. So now let's take this patient we're considering and make her an African-American woman instead. All the risk factors are exactly the same. What happens is her estimated risk goes from 6.6% below the threshold for, for considering statin to 9.5% in the threshold of where we should really start considering statin therapy. So race is a strong predictor of outcomes, and that's why it appears in that, race, in that ASCVD risk calculator. So statin therapy is, should be recommended for all high-risk patients, black, white, male, female, it doesn't matter. If you have a high cardiovascular risk, statin should be recommended. In many of our statin trials, they enrolled a broad population base for the inclusion, but fewer African-American patients in these trials. Yet all the data suggests that statins benefit black patients just like any other race ethnic group. 
and in fact, maybe even more. In one lipid lowering trial, the all hat lipid lowering trial, where they gave pravastatin 10 milligrams daily or usual care to individuals randomized, they saw that the lowest heart, coronary heart disease event rates were seen in the black patients who are on the pravastatin. So not only did black patients benefit, they benefited the most from being on the statin. Unfortunately, however, African Americans are less likely to receive statins. This is data on statin prescriptions and doses for African American and white patients that were collected from 138 community practices using electronic health data. So they found that African Americans were less likely to be prescribed a statin, and you can see that in the yellow bars. They were also less likely to receive appropriate statin dosing. You can see that as well. And that didn't matter whether it was primary prevention or secondary prevention or overall, African Americans were less likely to receive a statin prescription. And that, you know, we've seen this in other studies as well. This is a different study, again, using electronic health record data of 16,000 new statin users, a third of them black. They saw that the baseline LDL levels were higher in black patients, as you see there in the yellow bars. And even a year after a statin was prescribed to them, the LDL levels were still higher in blacks, and in fact, less than half were able to achieve their, their LDL goal of less than 100 milligrams per deciliter as compared to whites, where over 70% were able to achieve that goal. There's a lot of reasons. Some of the providers, some of the patients, some of the health systems, some of the insurance and, and income. But it's true that for very good historical reasons, African Americans may be less likely to trust the safety of medications that are recommended. And that is true for statins. So in this analysis, when asked the generic questions, I believe that statins are safe, I believe that statins are affected, or I trust my clinicians, African Americans were less likely to endorse those statements, the green bars, as compared to white patients. And unfortunately, that may contribute to the fact that African Americans are more likely to discontinue statin therapy once it's prescribed. This is a retrospective pharmacy claims analysis from about 2,500 primary care offices looking at predictors of statin discontinuation. And it found that individuals of African American race were twice as likely to discontinue their statin as compared to other patients. And unfortunately, discontinuing statin therapy is not benign. When statins are discontinued, cardiovascular events and mortality increase. This is a Danish study with 10-year follow-up and over 2 million patient years of follow-up. They evaluated cardiovascular event rates in individuals who had continued statin therapy or individuals who discontinued statin therapy over the time period. They saw that myocardial infarctions were much higher in the individuals that discontinued statin therapy, the red bars, as was cardiovascular death. So stopping statin is associated with significant increase in morbidity and mortality. And it's not just stopping all or nothing, it's also adherence. So this is again a retrospective analysis of over 300,000 adults with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. If you had high adherence to statins, you did the best. This is survival. If you had, that's people who had adherence of greater than 90%. If you had low adherence to statins, less than 50% of doses taken, then you had the poorest survival. So stat, taking your statin as directed is very important. And the, if you stop a statin altogether, there are enormous adverse events that you see. This is an analysis of 29,000 patients over the age of 65 who are receiving polypharmacy. And as you know, many clinicians, as patients get older, look at the number of medications they're taking and saying, we've got to get rid of some of these. And sometimes it's the statin that they discontinued. So when they looked at that in these patients and they saw those who stopped statin versus those who didn't, those who stopped their statin had much higher adverse event rates for cerebrovascular disease, heart failure, ischemic heart disease, 
composite cardiovascular events, total mortality, emergency department visits, or emergency department visits for neurologic diseases like stroke or TIA. So discontinuing statins was associated with a significantly worse outcome. What about women? Well, statins benefit everyone, including women, and even in primary prevention. So secondary prevention, no one ever disputed. But there was some discussion earlier on about whether statins benefited women in primary prevention. Well, this is a meta-analysis of primary prevention trials using statin therapy, showing that women really do derive the same benefits from statins as does any other population group. Unfortunately, women aren't always given statins and black women actually are given statins less often. And it's not surprising then that black women are less likely to achieve their LDL goals. This is an analysis of over 3000 older patients with dyslipidemia in six primary care practices. And you see the dotted orange line, black women were the least likely to have their LDL cholesterol controlled to appropriate levels. And again, as I mentioned, many women are never offered a statin. So this is looking at an analysis of patients over 5,000 in a primary care um, database. And they saw that more women were not on a statin than men. Many of them were never offered a statin. Some of them declined, but very low numbers, and many of them discontinued. And again, discontinuing statin therapy is associated with significant harm. Let's take a theoretical case. This is a um, composite of many patients I treat. This is a stock photo. But let's say this is a 64-year-old woman with recurrent atherosclerotic events. She's had a history of recurrent events such as non-ST elevation MI, TIA, unstable angina. For that, you have appropriately put her on atorvastatin 80 milligrams to get her LDL down. It was still higher than you'd like, so you added a zetamide 10 milligrams daily. When you see her in follow-up, she has an LDL of 92. Unfortunately, while on this therapy, she has recurrent unstable angina and is admitted. Her husband, who's a cardiologist, says, hey, can we get the LDL down even further so we can reduce her risk? And you say, that's an excellent idea. There's a really good rationale for pushing LDL even lower than current guidelines. So, when we've looked at achieved LDL and cardiovascular event rates, if you get the LDL down from 175 to 150, the event rates are lower. From 150 to 125, lower still. 125 to 100, lower still. Even down to below 50, lower still. So we've never seen the bottom or the floor of cardiovascular benefit with additional LDL lowering. So getting that LDL down in the highest risk patients, especially black women, is a exceptionally important. What do our current lipid guidelines say? Well, they say in patients at very high risk whose LDL remains above 70 on maximally tolerated statin and azetamide therapy, adding a PCSK9 inhibitor is reasonable. That's what I would recommend for our patient. What is PCSK9? Well, that stands for proprotein convertase subtilisin kexin type 9. That's a secreted protein that targets the LDL receptor for degradation. It was discovered in really interesting ways across the globe. First, in France, there was a group of cardiologists who had been caring, caring for some patients but very high LDL. They had just assumed they were familial hypercholesterolemia, which means an abnormality of the LDL receptor but they didn't know for sure, so they did a genotype analysis. When they did that, lo and behold, they found their LDL receptors were completely normal. The one thing that did come out of their analysis was a gain of function in a, a mutation in PCSK9, and that was what was associated with their high LDL levels. Across the world in Dallas, in the Dallas Heart Study, an NIH-sponsored epidemiology study, where they're just following a group of people in the Dallas area over time to see who develops disease. They measure many things throughout, including lipids, 
They'd been following these people for years who had really low LDLs in the 30 or 50 range. Nothing ever happened to them. They did very well. But they weren't sure why their LDLs were so low. When they did their genome-wide analysis, they found they had a loss of function mutation in PCSK9. Hey, so gain of function mutations in PCSK9 caused high LDL. Loss of function mutations in PCSK9 caused low LDL. So the pharmaceutical industry said, hey, we can capitalize on that by inhibiting PCSK9 to lower LDL levels. There's also a really good basic rationale for why statins plus PCSK9 together would work well, because anytime you put a patient on a statin, their PCSK9 levels are upregulated. So by inhibiting both, you could theoretically get much uh, better LDL lowering. So let's look at how that works. This is a cartoon. This is a hepatocyte here. The endothelial layer is up there above looking like railroad tracks. The T's are LDL receptors. The little round asteroids are the LDL molecules. And the little worms are PCSK9. So the way um, cholesterol is removed from our system is these LDL receptors go around grabbing LDL out of our systemic circulation. The entire complex is internalized receptor-mediated endocytosis. That's what Brown and Goldstein got the Nobel Prize for. Once it happens, then a very important next step is to separate the LDL molecule from the LDL receptor, because you want to destroy the LDL molecule while you want to send the LDL receptor back to the cell surface so it can go around grabbing more cholesterol. Now, if you have PCSK9 around, what happens is it hits the LDL receptor first. So when the LDL also attaches to the receptor, the entire complex is internalized. And now when you want to split the LDL and the LDL receptor apart, they can't, they're stuck together. So now they're all destroyed. That means you start depleting your cell surface of LDL receptors. When that happens, they can't go around grabbing LDL from systemic circulation, so LDL levels rise. Now, the whole idea behind PCSK9 inhibitors is let's intercept that PCSK9 so it never hits the LDL receptor. Now, the LDL molecule can still attach to the LDL receptor. It still gets internalized. They still can split apart. You destroy the LDL and send the LDL receptor back to the cell surface. That's the whole idea behind them. Let's see if it works. Well, there have been two major outcomes trials looking at that, the Fourier trial and the Odyssey outcomes trial. The Fourier trial was the first one published in 2017. We looked at evolocumab and clinical outcomes in patients with cardiovascular disease. So 27,000 high-risk patients, they had prior MI, prior stroke, or symptomatic peripheral arterial disease, they all received a statin plus azetamibe and tried to get their LDL down below 70. But if their LDL remained above 70, then they could be randomized to evolopamab, the PCSK9 inhibitor, which is administered via subcutaneous injection every two weeks or a matching placebo. They then followed them up for about two years looking for a composite of cardiovascular death, MI, stroke, hospitalization for unstable angina, or coronary revascularization. These are the outcomes. Those who got randomized to evolocumab had a 15% relative risk reduction with a number needed to treat of only 67. That was the first PCSK9 inhibitor um, outcome trial released. The next one was the Od Odyssey um, outcomes trial. This was looking at the PCSK9 inhibitor aliarocumab and cardiovascular outcomes after acute coronary syndrome. So they looked at almost 19,000 patients who had an acute coronary syndrome between one month to one year earlier. They all again got statin plus azetabibe trying to get their LDL to less than 70. If they couldn't get there, then they were randomized. Again, aliarocumab delivers subcutaneously every two weeks or matching placebo. Their primary outcome was a composite of coronary heart disease, death, MI, stroke, hospitalization for unstable angina, and they were followed up for almost three years. Again, you saw very similar results, a 15% relative risk reduction with the number needed to treat of 63. Now, in all of these trials, there weren't as many um, African-American black patients or non-white patients as we'd like to be enrolled, but those who were enrolled over um, non-white patients, 437, 
there was a significant reduction in LDL, just like they had with the um, other race ethnic groups. So PCSK9 inhibitors seem to benefit all patients equally. So what have we learned from all these trials? Well, remember in 1994, the very first trial of statin therapy showing us you could get a total mortality reduction, the PORUS trial was, was released. In that trial, they enrolled people with really high LDLs, close to 200. They didn't have a lot of other risk factors, but they got that LDL down and they saw significant benefit. So it was clear from that that high LDL is bad. After that, we started saying, well, let's look at more moderate LDL levels. So the CARE trial, lipid trial, and heart protection study trials came out with more moderate baseline LDL levels, around 130, and then they lowered that and saw a benefit. So we realized that average LDL is not good. We still tried to lower the bar. We said, hey, let's look at even lower levels. And that was with the Prove It trial and the Treat to New Targets trial. So we got the LDL even lower. We saw that lower is even better. Then the Improve It trial, on the background of statin therapy, they added azetamide. With the azetamide addition, you only get about a 15% additional LDL lowering, but they still got benefit. So it showed that even lower is even better. Now with the PCSK9 inhibitor trials, we see that you can get a lot of LDL lowering, about 50 to 60% additional LDL lowering on top of the statin. So now we know lowest really is best. Unfortunately, um, it's not always easy to get access to PCSK9 inhibitors. They are very expensive, and insurance companies are limiting access to them. This is some data showing how hard it is to get the PCSK9 inhibitors approved, and they all, 100% of them, require a prior off. So in this study, they looked at 44,000 PCSK9 inhibitor prescriptions. 83% were initially rejected right off the board. And even after giving all the data and the documentation requested, 57% were ultimately rejected. We saw that approval was more likely if the patient was already on high intensity statin plus azetamide, but still very high rates of rejection. In another study looking at 45,000 PCSK9 inhibitor prescriptions, 79% were rejected within 24 hours, within 24 hours and 53% were ultimately rejected even after all the documentation was received. And again, rejection was pretty similar across the different payers, about 33 to 78% are rejected for commercial payers, government payers, and across pharmacy benefit managers. And what is even more distressing is that 35% of fill prescriptions were ultimately abandoned at the pharmacy. What would make a patient go through all of that and then ultimately abandon their prescription? If the copay is too high. I've had patients who got their prior auth approved, but the monthly copay was almost a thousand dollars. So there's a number of reasons for PCSK9 inhibitor denial, and insurance companies will probably come up with new ones. But the ones we often see are failure to clearly document the indication, failure to document a diagnosis of familiar hypercholesterolemia, and how you made that diagnosis. Was it just looking at their family history and risk? Was it genetics? What did you do? Failure to um, submit all the office notes and lab tests. Failure to re-challenge a patient that you described as statin intolerance. Failure to try high intensity statin plus azetamide. And failure to document real compliance with therapy. So if you clearly specify for the reason for which you're prescribing the PCSK9 inhibitor, PCSK9 inhibitor prior auth approval mm -hmm. is more likely give all your notes that you need, include physical exam with any relevant findings like Arcus, Cornelius, Xanthomas, et cetera. This is really important because I've had patients be denied because they said, I every year they ask you to reauthorize a patient for PCSK9 inhibitor. I have a patient with familial hypercholesterolemia who went from an LDL of over 200 to down to 130 and was doing well. When it came time to reauthorize it, we submitted everything and it came back rejected immediately saying the LDL is too low. Of course the LDL is too low because she's been on a PCSK9 inhibitor. So we try to document the highest LDL they've had. So what her off therapy PCS, her off PCSK9 inhibitor LDL was. And make sure you include all the lab tests that they asked for. 
Now, just want to, as a little teaser, give you some new and upcoming technology, which we'll be seeing probably in the next few years, and that's gene silencing technology using small interfering RNA, siRNA. So RNA interference. So basically, we all remember this from genetics class. You have a gene. It's transcribed to mRNA, which is like the template. And from that template, you translate the protein. The protein then, if it's a disease-causing protein, you have to figure out how to inhibit it, like with monoclonal antibodies, such as the PCSK9 inhibitors. This whole new way of thinking about it says, hey, what if we just attack the mRNA with siRNA? So you actually can never translate the protein. So you still make the, you have the gene, you still transcribe it to mRNA, but you can never translate it to the protein that causes disease. Therefore, you never get the disease and you don't have to think about ways of inhibiting that protein. That's the theory behind RNA interference with siRNA. There is an, an in late stage development, a molecule that uses siRNA to inhibit PCSK9. It's called enclycerin. What they have found that just two doses, up to six months, you can get LDL reduction. This is looking at the placebo. This is the enclycerin, and it's sustained. This was studied in a clinical trial called Orion 10. And again, they had one injection at baseline, one to three months, another one six months later, and then another one six months after that. And they kept an LDL reduction of over 50%. And the safety profile was pretty good. You see here that the SAAs between placebo arm and enclycerin arm were pretty similar. Okay, and I just want to finish up with something that's difficult to talk about and very difficult to measure, but bias, whether implicit or explicit. Maybe our black women are not being having as good outcomes because we're not always treating them the same or as well as they should be. This was a pivotal study in the New England Journal of Medicine from 1999, looking at prescriber physician bias. So they took a bunch of actors. They gave them all the same fake names, fake, fake income, fake address, fake everything, fake terrible hospital garb. They gave a classic picture of someone with a coronary syndrome who needed to go to the cat lab. And then they asked the physicians, who do you want to send? Turns out they sent the white patients much more often than they did the black patients. And the one that they were least likely to send was the black woman. Investigators were trying to figure out why. They said, so maybe there's this bias. They just don't like her. So they did these likability scores. Turns out they liked the black woman the most. They just did not want to send her. So we have to consider bias when it comes to our high-risk patients. But remember, LDL is the causative agent for atherosclerosis, and targeting LDL with statins is the mainstay of reducing cardiovascular risk in patients. Intensity of lipid lowering therapy should match the intensity of risk. So if you have a high risk patient, you want high intensity therapy, and that often includes high dose statin, zetamide, PCSK9 inhibitor. African Americans are amongst the highest risk group, and African American women are often undertreated. So we need to get them on their statin, get the, all the risk reducing therapies we know. And in the future, we might have access to novel lipid lowering agents that could improve patient adherence and improve outcomes. We'll have to see. Thank you so much for your attention. I'd be happy to um, stick around for some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Our next presentation will be Pharmacology and Side Effects of Statins by Dr. Kevin B. Sneed. He's the Senior Associate Vice President of USF Health and Professor and Dean at Snyder College of Pharmacy, University of South Florida. Dr. Sneed. Dr. Ferdinand, thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you very much to the National Black Nurses Association for once again inviting me to come back and talk to you today. And we're going to have a very brief uh, conversation about uh, pharmacology and side effects of statins. Uh, I'm going to take you all into a brief review of pharmacology. I know that's a little bit painful, but then overall, um, I can't cover the entire expanse of everything today, but I look forward to having a really great conversation with many of you. 
So I have no financial disclosures at this time. And many of the images in the presentation, some of them belong to uh, US of Health and uh, cannot always be shared. So just a brief background. So overall, as we already know, cardiovascular disease has claimed many lives here in the United States and remains the number one killer and cause of death here in the United States. Overall, when you think about coronary heart disease and accounting for about 13% of the deaths in uh, 2017 and almost 400,000 people a year succumb to car just coronary heart disease alone. Very often we think about cardiovascular disease being a heart related condition, but we do know that stroke and heart attack very often are one and the same and should be treated as such. They are cardiovascular risk equivalents with each other. And overall, greater than 25% of US adults greater than age 40 uh, take a statin right now, which translates to about over 25 million men and women. And we know that statins are one of the leading treatments for the treatment of cardiovascular complications. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about pharmacology. So many of you, when you were taking your pharmacology courses, or you may have heard, you know, we refer to the statins as being an HMG CoA reductase inhibitor. And in my world, in our pharmacology and world and in our college of pharmacy, we make them understand what that exactly means. Hydroxy methylglutyryl coenzyme A reductase inhibitor. And again, overall, we know that these can be life-saving medications, but many studies have shown over time that we have a, a particular challenge in keeping people adherent to taking the medication. Patients often report that the symptoms that they're having attribute, uh, that are attributable to the statin are some of the causes and reasons why they don't continue the medications. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. But we also know that many people that either cannot maintain use of a statin or have stopped them because of a side effect, uh, they wind up having an increased chance of opportunity for an MI or some other cardiovascular event. And therefore, the goal of therapy for many of our clinicians around the country should be doing everything we can to identify a patient that may be at risk for not being on a statin or uh, making sure that we can identify any risk associated with any adverse effects and try, trying to find ways to overcome them. So again, I know that statin pharmacology can be very difficult to understand, and I'm not here to try and make you all go back and learn organic chemistry all over again. However, I just want to go ahead and give you a little bit of a quick history about the pharmacology of statins. So right there, you hear, you see the word compactin. That was, that was actually one of the original statins ever, ever produced by any pharmaceutical company. And they began studies and had very, very good studies going in 1980. But because they were not sure of the dosing, they had to stop the studies and therefore did not advance on. Lovastatin was one of the first um, statin drugs to be approved, again, in 1987, uh, which was Lovastatin from Merck, Sharp, and Dome. But since that time, many other statins have come onto the market. So what you're seeing here, uh, the, the statins highlighted in yellow, they're what we call the natural statins. Uh, they come from a, a, a fungal or a yeast very similar to the red yeast rice that many of you have already encountered over the counter or in herbal stores and many of your patients have probably come and talked to you about. Everything highlighted here in kind of the um, kind of the orange or, or light red all indicate synthetic statins. But we want to make sure that we have an understanding that all the statins shown here have very similar pharmacology with a very similar what we call physical chemical background, uh, backbone, I'm sorry with a very similar backbone that allows them to go in and inhibit the HMG CoA reductase in the liver. I put this slide in just very simply to also kind of bring light to the fact that you know, we kind of divide them into two categories, either being lipophilic or being very easily influenced um, uh, by, by the lipid status of the cells or being more hydrophilic, meaning they interact more with water in the cells. And this becomes a very, very, very key and important component for understanding future drug interactions or the potential for any adverse effects that people may be having. So overall, um, uh, just again, uh, these statins, what they do, they go in and they inhibit 
uh, HMG, which is one of the pathways that will lead to the production of cholesterol in the, in the liver or hepatically, as we would say it. Anytime that you lower the amount of uh, HMG, you're actually, you wind up limiting uh, a very key component called mevalonate. And therefore, once you inhibit that, you wind up inhibiting the amount of cholesterol being capable of being produced in the liver. However, that's not really how we lower the cholesterol in the body. When you lower the amount of cholesterol being manufactured in the liver, it causes an upregulation of LDL receptors on the surface cells of the liver, and thereby they actually retrieve and pluck, kind of pluck out of the blood actual uh, LDL particles that are being transported back in what we call reverse transport back to the liver from the blood by HDL particles. So again, the true pharmacology is not just the reduction of cholesterol being manufactured in the liver, but the subsequent upregulation of LDL receptors that we find. And here I, I just show an image that kind of explains that just a little bit further. So again, we have HMG coe reductase leading to a reduction in cholesterol. Eventually, we wind up having an increase in the LDL receptors. And it's really important to understand that genetically, some people uh, don't have the capability of building those LDL receptors, thereby leading to the reduction of, of LDL cholesterol in the blood. These, uh, they fall into what we call the FH or familial hypercholesterolemia category. And we have other medications now on the market that can treat that but it has been a limitation of statin therapy for many years before we had these other medications on the market. What I'm showing you here is just uh, my own um, uh, figure that I put together with a graduate student one year, really beginning to explain exactly the entire pathway. And so there you find right there in the middle, statins, when they inhibit everything from that HMG coe reductase, everything after that is inhibited. Now we're gonna come back in, uh, to this image a little bit later and talk about the impact of what that could mean in the way of people experiencing some adverse effects or potentially experiencing adverse effects. Another thing I really wanna make sure all of you are aware is how the body metabolizes statins. They're not all created equal. They're not all uh, created the very same way and the body does not respond to them all the very same way. Here I've highlighted uh, those that are, are metabolized by cytochrome P450 in the 3A4 pathway. And here you find lovastatin, simvastatin, and atorvastatin are the ones that are primarily um, uh, metabolized in that, in that pathway. Now, when you move over to uh, resuvastatin, we find that it is actually metabolized more in what we call the 2C9 pathway for cytochrome P450, much different from the previous one. And then right there in the middle, we find pravastatin, which actually doesn't uh, come into contact with any of that, and it's what we call hydrolyzed, meaning that the water systems in the body break it down for metabolism. And therefore, and I'll point out, point out a little bit more later, pravastatin tends to have the least amount of lipophilic involvement with the muscles all around the body. Now, again, I've kinda, I have another uh, table here that kind of shows a little bit more of exactly what I was referring to earlier. Some are synthetically made, but some are natural products. They are made from natural yeast uh, foundation. Here again, lovastatin and pravastatin being the main ones. They are very chemically identical to uh, what we find over the counter in red yeast rice. So why not tell people to go and use that? Well, we don't have very good confidence in the, in the overall manufacturing standards for the over-the-counter red yeast rice, but we do have a lot of confidence in the overall manufacturing standards here for lovastatin and pravastatin being the natural statins that are on the market. Simvastatin is what we call semi-synthetic, even though it's not shown that way here. It has a little bit of the components of both. Now this hydrophilicity is very important because if, we, if indeed we have an individual that begins to have some side effects, it's really good to understand exactly where they fall in terms of the overall uh, cascade of whether or not they are um, much more hydrophilic or much more lipophilic. By and large, most of the very lipophilic statins, if you are going to have any muscle involvement or having to require a dosage adjustment because of, the, uh, because of a drug interaction, 
are probably going to fall in what we call the lipophilic areas. There again, simvastatin being the most um, lipophilic of all the currently available statins on the market. So it's very important to understand well, what lipophilicity means. And very often, if we encounter someone that's having a problem, uh, it's not a bad idea clinically to begin to work your way down from a more lipophilic to a more hydrophilic uh, statin. Now, one thing I do as a clinical pharmacologist and still actively involved clinically is that I really want to make sure that if I can get a, what I call a two-for-one on any medication, it's really important to understand. Uh, I want to know what else can that medication do beyond the FDA-approved indicator. Now, for time's sake, we don't have time to go into the in entire table that we've uh, shown here, but there's a term that we call pleiotropic effect, meaning a, an additional benefit that you can get from having statin therapy. And we know that all of the beneficial benefits that I've highlighted here have a, can have a very positive impact and a very positive outcome on overall cardiovascular health and wellness of a patient. Again, endothelial uh, cells benefit from being on statin therapy, um, uh, decreasing the, the smooth muscle cell migration that can occur from plaque formation can actually be mitigated significantly by being on statin therapy. Having an increase in nitric oxide production and utilization of what we call ENOS is really important, meaning nitric oxide, endothelial nitric oxide. But now that can be promoted by statin therapy. Antiplatelet activity, and then also, and probably most important, we find a marked reduction in all of the pro-inflammatory uh, proteins associated with cardiovascular disease. And I've highlighted that here on the far right. And then finally, following on the work of Paul Ricker and his group from Brigham and Women's Hospital um, many, many years ago, several decades ago, showing a marked increase in C-reactive protein, thereby showing a reduction in overall cardiovascular driven inflammation. All of these are benefits of being on statin therapy. So let's talk a little bit more about adverse effects that you can, that a patient can uh, encounter if, they, if you decide to put them on statin therapy. Again, after many, many years, and I go back to 1987, actually I'll go back to 1980 on that one slide. They, 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 uh, the initial company, Sankyo, they stopped manufacturing and they stopped uh, clinical trials of that medication because of side effects. But it turned out not to be a true side effect. They were overdosing at the time the animals that, we, that they were doing the clinical trials in. They were doing the equivalent of five to 750 milligrams of these particular medications that now we're only giving 20, 40, or 60 milligrams in. But they didn't understand back then. But it's really important that we learned a great deal from that time. And we've been studying the impact of side effects for uh, statins ever since that time. And I showed just a few of what we have here. And this particular uh, slide and the subsequent slides coming up I really go into a single article review that was done um, on behalf of the, the American Heart Association to really begin to dig into a little bit more of the side effects that people can encounter. One of the most important things that people will encounter potentially will be muscle involvement, uh, statin-induced myalgias, and we're going to have an entire section on that here in just a moment. Uh, there has been question whether or not statins can lead to diabetes. Or the, or, or the onset of diabetes. And again, we found very, very modest, modest potential for that to occur. Over many years, people have always been very concerned about hepatotoxicity from statin therapy because of exactly where it works in the body, meaning primarily in the liver. This is a very rare occurrence for it to occur. And typically and usually, anytime that we uh, find that the hepatic enzymes are elevated, we're looking for anything um, uh, anywhere from three to 10 times the upper limit of normal for hepatic enzymes. And it tends to be a pretty rare occurrence for that to occur. Again, um, people had questions about neurological effects of statins, and we really haven't found that to be uh, a true problem. There has been a very, very, very small and very slight association with potential for hemorrhagic stroke, but we have to keep in mind that many of the people we're talking about already have other risk factors for the very same condition on uh, developing. And as I show here on the far right, the risk reduction continues to favor being on statin therapy. 
And overall, cancer, when they had questions about it, as much as we have gone over the years, we cannot find a true association at all that statins have any association with the onset of cancer. There had been a question about tendon rupture. That tends not to um, be very consistently shown. Uh, cataract and kidney, again, uh, everything shows it not to be very, very prevalent at all, nothing to worry about. And there even had been a condition of what we call steroidogenesis in both women and men. And again, have found that it is not clinically relevant if you have a reduction in anything involving um, the reproductive organs for the, for the human body. So let's talk a little bit more about this muscle involvement. The number one side effect that, that will probably lead people to discontinuing a statin therapy. Again, I bring you back to the pathway I showed earlier, and I'm gonna show it again in just a moment. But down in the lower right corner, once you inhibit the HMG-CoA reductase at one location, thereby limiting the amount of mevalonate that's being produced, along that pathway, you get to the very lower right corner, you find the word ubiquinone, or what we commonly refer to as coenzyme Q10. So now I bring you back here, and one of the most important things we need to know, coenzyme Q10 is a, is a, uh, a cofactor for muscle function overall. It involves both red muscle and white muscle matter in the body. And overall, um, over the years, we have encountered that when, if we, we feel that if we have a reduction in that area with the ubiquinone or CoQ10, having involvement in either the red muscle or white muscle involvement, that people can develop either all the way from what we call myalgias, all the way developing onto myopathies, and then potentially even further. And I'll show that in a moment. In the lower right corner, you find the word ASIC3. That's not the shoe. Many people have ASIC running shoes. That stands for acid sensing ion channels. And we think that becomes one of the, the initial warning signs for people that may be having a problem from the statin therapy when their body begins to have a breakdown of the muscle and it begins to sense the acid that's building up potentially in the body. So here we have some quick definitions. Again, myalgias. Um, uh, right there highlighted in blue, uh, a muscle ache or weakness you know, without creatinine kinase elevation. We'll come back to that in a moment. Myopathy or myositis, more importantly, is when you actually have enough breakdown to have detectable levels of an increase in creatinine kinase or leading potentially to a very life-threatening condition, rhabdomyolysis, where you have very marked destruction of muscular tissue leading to very significant CK elevation and creatinine elevation. And actually that could potentially lead to, very, uh, to kidney injury and death. So my own journey in this area very quickly began uh, many, many, many years ago, even when Dr. Ferdinand was a professor of mine. And I came across uh, many articles in the, in the mid nineties talking about coenzyme Q10 for the treatment of heart failure. And I began really trying to understand the mechanism of what that meant. And one article um, uh, in 2006 really kind of helped me understand a little bit more. And I apologize, I know it's very difficult to read, but the concentration in the body of being a, at about 300 milligrams per day, the equivalent of that, is very important to understand that if we do anything with a statin to wind up decreasing the amount that the body will naturally produce, that it could wind up leading to some other problem. So here on the very bottom, the authors um, concurred well, they kind of, they, the authors uh, kind of came along and said that if you're going to have that, a dose of two to 300 milligrams per day should probably be used if indeed you intend to try and use coenzyme Q10 for the treatment of any, any challenges, in this case, for heart failure. Then I began to chase down a, a, a young physician uh, by the name of Patricia Kelly and the work she was doing on uh, myopathic symptoms, again, in statin therapy. And she was the one that really began, or her group, they were the ones that really began to make a distinction between myalgias and myopathy. Many people have myalgias, and that can manifest not only as muscle um, pain, but it can be also joint pain. And there are other diffuse things that people have to watch out for. But it doesn't mean that they're having a breakdown of the muscle. And that's why if you do a CK uh, test, it will not always be elevated, nor will you have any elevations in hepatic enzyme production. 
And so uh, most recently, uh, a meta-analysis went back and looked at all of the clinical trials that were involved. And they came up with about 12 very good studies that they used for their criteria in the meta-analysis. And they really wanted to uh, figure out uh, two things based on clinical trial data. Number one, does CoQ, uh, coenzyme Q10 supplementation, does it help with the statin-associated uh, myopathy? Or number two, if you have coenzyme Q10, would that even have, lead to a decrease or have any impact whatsoever on CK levels? And the results of what they found, again, you see here at the very bottom, that CoQ10 supplementation did have a decrease in overall muscle pain, muscle weakness, and muscle tiredness that pe some people were feeling, but it did not have a decrease in the plasma uh, creatinine kinase level. And here we can see exactly what they found. And, and keep in mind the large confidence intervals, anything that crosses zero means that they, it was not statistically significant. But what you found, find here on the plot graph on the left is that coenzyme Q10 for muscle symptoms did have a beneficial effect in the majority of the clinical trials that were, that were reviewed. But also here on the, on the graph on the right, the plot on the right, at uh, plasma creatinine kinase levels, uh, were not affected at all by coenzyme Q10 supplementation. So there continues to be much review and much controversy about whether or not statin-induced myopathy or myalgias can be su successfully treated with coenzyme Q10. And one of the most important things that we want you to know is that if, an, if indeed an individual that you are treating winds up having a myalgia from that, that it may be worth a try of giving coenzyme Q10 at no less than 200 milligrams a day, but even higher if, ne if necessary, to see if that may help resi uh, resolve some of the myalgias and myopathies that people are, are experiencing. Now, that kind of led me on a different part of the journey in terms of pharmacogenomics, and I just wanted to briefly cover this for a moment. Uh, back in 2008, again, on my journey of trying to better understand how can we do more to keep people on their statin therapy, came across a really groundbreaking article at the time. I talked about this particular um, uh, gene, uh, in this case, SLC01B1, and how it became predictive for people that were, if they were put on, at the time, simvastatin, as to whether or not we could predict if they were going to have a myopathy or not. And so here in the conclusion, you can find that uh, we have identified common variants in SLC01B1 that are strongly associated with an increased risk of statin-induced myopathy. A very famous graph that you've probably seen by now, but again, going back and, and looking at the entire genome and the portions of the genome that were associated potentially with any uh, muscle involvement, cardiac involvement, or anything else. And we found this one gene, you can see it pointed out there on the far left, that had an association for people that, that kind of really jumped off of the scales, for people that actually had myopathy and had, um, and, and, and had what we call a SNP that would actually be predictive of whether or not that individual if they ha had this particular mutation, that would actually um, uh, develop myopathy. And then here on the far right, you see anyone that had what we call the CC genotype was far more likely to have myopathies that would develop secondary to being on, at the time, simvastatin, more so than if they were uh, either the, the CT genotype or the TT genotype. So again, in conclusion, what it really came down to is that we began thinking, hey, maybe we found a, um, you know, the pathway for trying to predict who may have myopathies if we uh, want to put them on any statin. And right here, in the, um, <clears throat> right here on, the, on the third bullet point, it says uh, these findings are very likely to apply to other statins. But then as we found out, that turned out not to be very true. It has not been transferable to each and every other statin to the very same extent that we have found with simvastatin. However, there continues to be ongoing research and I do believe progress is being made. 
So again, just to very quickly show you all from a pharmacogenomic standpoint, and there's an enormous amount of research, even recently, that continues to go on trying to find the, uh, the grail, if you will, of how can we predict when and where and how a particular patient may actually develop any uh, adverse events, primarily focused on myopathies. But there may be other things we want to try and predict, simply looking at the genomic makeup of the individual. And I'm actually doing work here that continues to look in this area uh, so that we can understand a lot better that cardiovascular disease is the next realm of where pharmacogenomics and personalized medicine can go. Very quickly, I just want to show you all um, why it becomes so important to look at the genome of an individual and not simply look at race and or other factors that we visually look at when we try to assess the patient. Here we have a picture of Tiger Woods, Beyonce, and Lenny Kravitz. By our standard, we would all see that they are similarly complected, they're all in about the same age group, and that they're all African-American. But if we take a look at their parents, and we find that Tiger Woods having an African-American father and an Asian mother, uh, Beyonce having what we would call two traditional uh, African-American parents, although I continue to hear about the Creole mixture in there somewhere along the way. And again, Lenny Kravitz having an African-American mother and a Caucasian father, we understand that genetically they're all different. And that means that we're all different. And so the realm and the possibilities of pharmacogenomics become far more important moving into the future so that we can truly, really truly understand how to treat you as an individual and not simply rely upon population-wide studies that have not gone down to the genomic level. So to kind of, kind of close everything out here, I'll kind of go through five bullet points of um, our discussion today. Again, it's very, and very, very, very important to understand that statins have proven to be a very life-saving, and we want to do everything we can to try and keep people on statins uh, so that we can help treat and prevent cardiovascular complications. I think I've shown all of you here that the physical chemical properties of the statins are far different. We don't want to lump them all into the very same category. We want to appreciate each one for what it is, the chemical differences that they do, and how the body will respond to them. Uh, recognition of some of the other things that are beyond just the, the, the lipid-lowering effect of, of, of uh, statins can be very beneficial for our patient, patients. So the pleiotropic effects I talked about. Again, nothing that you're going to routinely order in terms of labs However, very important to understand that once you put an individual on statin therapy, that the pleiotropic or the additional benefit to the cardiovascular system overall is pretty much well-defined by, by now. Um, bullet point number four, we want to make sure that we understand the adver adverse effect uh, potential for every patient. And also, we want to make sure that, we want, that people are not getting bad information, much like we've seen now with COVID-19. If they continue to hear that uh, if you put me on that particular statin, it may cause cancer or it may cause this problem or that problem. Well, we have decades of information that can refute many of the things that people may read about online or, or in social media uh, circles. And then finally, uh, really understanding the role of personalized medicine around pharmacogenomics and really beginning to hone in and, and see if we can predict who may have an actual challenge when it comes to um, any myopathies, myalgias, or any other adverse effect, and making sure that you're keeping up with all of the information that's happening in the personalized medicine world. And so with that, I look forward to interacting with many of you. I look forward to answering any additional questions that could not be covered in this very expansive topic in a 30-minute period. And again, I'm very happy for the opportunity to have come before the National Black Nurses Association uh, for another year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sneed. Our next presentation will discuss hypertriglyceremia with a focus on fish oil and a new medication, icosopenth ethyl. It will be Dr. Rachel Bond, Systems Director of the Women's Heart Health at Dignity Health in Arizona, and the ABC co-chair of Cardiovascular Disease in Women and Children Committee. Dr. Bond. Thank you so much, Dr. Fernand, for that wonderful introduction. As uh, noted, I will be talking today on hypertriglyceridemia, 
both fish oil and icosapent ethyl. To begin, I do not have any relevant financial disclosures. And more importantly, what we're going to be talking about today are threefold. The first, we're going to review the current state of cardiovascular risk reduction. We're then going to delve into learning a little bit more about fish oil, as well as the FDA-approved therapies such as icosapent ethyl. And lastly, we're going to understand emerging areas for research. So to begin, I really wanted to delve first into the current state of cardiovascular disease risk reduction and the role residual risk lowering therapies may play. And when we think about the cornerstone of cardiovascular risk reduction, we have to start by thinking about lifestyle. That encompasses both diet as well as exercise. From a dietary perspective, we know that the best evidence to reduce myocardial infarction is actually either the Mediterranean diet or the DASH diet, as suggested by both the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association. That entails a diet high in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, low in fat, such as really making sure we're not having more than 30 to 35% of our total caloric intake being fat content. Specifically, though, when we think about fat, we really want to make sure less than 6% encompasses saturated fat, and we're avoiding all trans fat together. We also want to have regular fish intake because it's that regular fish that has that healthy fatty acid, which is something we're going to be delving into, which is that omega-3 fatty acid, which a lot of times we do get from fish oil. Now, when it comes to exercise, we know that the best evidence shows that to de decrease cardiovascular risk, we really should be walking in a brisk pace for about 30 minutes, five days a week. It's important though, and we're mindful that the patient really should choose what's most enjoyable and sustainable to them when it comes to overall activity. But there are times when beyond lifestyle, diet and exercise, we may need the help of other medications to really lower our cardiovascular risk. And when we think about specifically the cornerstone of what drives cardiovascular disease, specifically atherosclerosis, LDL, the low density lipoprotein is really that causative agent. And as a result, statins, which is a medication that's been around for several decades, has been really impactful in lowering the, the poor outcomes that we see overall from cardiovascular disease. Here are some landmark trials that really demonstrate demonstrate the fact that the lower your LDL cholesterol, the lower your event rate. However, I want to emphasize the fact that even in situations where people are placed on statin therapy, be it for secondary prevention, because they have known cardiovascular disease, or for primary prevention, because they fall into one of the higher risk groups, there still may very well be a residual risk of cardiovascular disease, even in those patients on that high intensity group. And this has been shown in a few different trials, and that risk can range anywhere from 8.7 to 22.4% on those on high dose statins. And obviously, that risk is even higher on those on standard statin dose therapy. And it brings to really, I think, the emphasis of this talk that despite really lowering LDL cholesterol, there needs to be other options out there for reducing our cardiovascular risk. And really those options are changing the course. And although LDL lowering, we need to emphasize and it should not be bypassed, maybe thinking about opening up the can of worms and thinking about other options would be a better approach. When it comes to LDL lowering, we know that if we're well above that threshold of what is suggested by the guidelines, we have non-statin therapies such as azetamide or bile acid sequestrants or PCSK9 inhibitors or bempedoic acid, or even our fixed bempedoic acid azetamide. Beyond that, we now have emerging options for LDL lowering with agents that are awaiting FDA approval, such as inclizerin, as an example. But what about other aspects such as coagulation, platelet, metabolism, inflammation, and lipoproteins? And really the emphasis of this slide, which is very busy, is really to highlight the fact that maybe in our pocket, in our arsenal, we should be thinking about other ways to lower that cardiovascular risk. And perhaps a really impactful way is to hone in on that omega-3 fatty acid, that fish oil. So what is fish oil as well as an FDA approved agent such as a cosapin ethyl really target? Well, they targets triglycerides. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why targeting triglycerides may be important. 
The fact is, is that the prevalence of elevated triglycerides is about a quarter of the adult population in the United States. And the way we define that is by a triglyceride level greater than 150 milligrams per deciliter. This is a particular concern because evidence has shown that there is absolutely a causal role of triglycerides in the pathway of cardiovascular disease. Even studies showing that levels above 100 may place one at a higher risk for cardiovascular disease, meaning that our optimal level really should be less than 100. Now, when we think about things that cause our triglycerides to be elevated, of course, diet is a major part of that. We also know sedentary lifestyle is as well, increased body weight, excessive alcohol intake, and cigarette smoking. But there are some medical conditions we have to be thinking about as well, such as poorly controlled diabetes, hypothyroid disease, chronic kidney disease, nephrotic syndrome as an example, autoimmune disease such as lupus, HIV, as well as pregnancy, especially in the third trimester. It's for that reason, it is actually suggested we do not check a lipid panel during pregnancy. But beyond that, we know some medications can bring it on. And in some rare situations, it could be genetic as well. Now, we have ways of lowering triglycerides. And as I started our presentation, the cornerstone of lowering our cardiovascular risk in general has to be lifestyle. And that's the same for triglycerides. We always want to start with lifestyle a heart healthy diet and exercise. But beyond that, if we have a patient who has a severe form of elevations in their triglycerides, as defined by a level greater than or equal to 500 milligrams per deciliter, that's where we may want to think about the use of older agents such as fibrates, niacin, as well as our newer agents such as these prescription omega three fatty acids. We also know that the options for adding on these agents may come into play if the person has a persistent elevated triglyceride level, despite being on a statin therapy, that highest intensity statin therapy that they're able to, to tolerate. And that's usually levels anywhere from 200 to 500 milligrams per deciliter. As I alluded to, we do have some FDA approved agents of which we know that that approval of omega-3 fatty acid products contains two long chain fatty acids, one being DHA, the other being EPA, and they are effective options for the treatment of high triglyceride levels. And with those two fatty long acid products, I really wanted to talk about a tale of two United States trials that have been really impactful in thinking about the use of fish oil and adding it to the possible way or the pathway for us to lower one's cardiovascular risk. The first trial really was the STRENGTH trial, and that's the statin residual risk reduction with Epinova and high cardiovascular risk patients with hypertriglyceridemia. This study looked at about 686 sites in, two, in 220 countries. They enrolled about 13,078 statin-treated patients with or at high risk for cardiovascular disease. And the way they defined high risk risk was either one, having a known cardiovascular disease history, be it coronary, peripheral, carotid, or even aortic disease, or having diabetes with one or two, basically type one diabetes, type two diabetes, if they were above the age of 40 in a man or above the age of 50 in a female with at least one risk factor. And that risk factor included smoking, it included um, elevations in their high sensitivity CRP level above two, it included evidence of moderate albumin in their urine, or even evidence of elevations in their blood pressure, or the last category was a high risk group from a primary prevention patient in a male above the age of 50, or a female above the age of 60, who had at least one risk factor, including a family history of premature heart disease, along with evidence at least of some form of impaired kidney function or even a calcium score in the very high range, greater than 300 units as an example. And what they ended up doing was is that they randomized these patients that also beyond having a high risk for cardiovascular disease had evidence of an elevated triglyceride level, any, any level between 180 to 500 and low HDL cholesterol. And they randomized them to corn oil, which was felt to be a neutral control versus that carboxylic acid formulation of omega-3 known as Epinova. And that was at a dose of four grams per day. The treatment arm did show that there was a notable elevation in their EPA levels when they actually focused focused in on those different fatty chains of the long acid, long acid fatty chains, 
But they also noticed that from basically uh, over a course of a year, it was accompanied by a 19% reduction in their triglyceride levels, as well as a 20% reduction in their high sensitivity CRP levels. And through a median follow up of 42 months, although Epinova showed a reduction in triglycerides, it did not reduce the primary outcome composite endpoint of cardiovascular death myocardial infarction, coronary revascularization, or hospitalizations from unstable angina. And thus, it was felt to be medically futile, and thus they actually stopped the trial. Now, it brings to light the, these different fatty acid chains, because is that a reason why the strength study in Epinova maybe wasn't as successful as what we will be talking about, which is the acostapin ethyl trial? Because the fact is, is that all omega-3 fatty acids are not created equal. And when you think about actually eating PA, we know that standardly, it enters the cell in a very nice straight line, as you can see very well depicted here. And because it enters in a straight line, it actually leads to stabilization of the cell membrane. The way that DHA enters the cell, it actually comes in in a curved appearance or a curvature. And as a result of that, it leads to a disruption of the cell membrane. And this is very important because when we think about Epinova, it doesn't just have EPA, but it also had that DHA format. So here we then sort of look at another pivotal trial, which is the Reduce It study. And with the Reduce It study, they only looked at the use of pure EPA. And what they ended up doing was they used a dose of four grams per day, and they focused on patients that had elevations in their triglyceride levels who were receiving a standard treatment dose for statins, and they randomized them to either the use of the icosapin ethyl versus use of placebo. The placebo that they used was not corn oil, but it was mineral oil, which I believe there has been some controversy to suggest that the use of the fact it was mineral oil may have led to the reduction in absorption of the statin in that control arm. However, that has not been proven. That being said, when we looked at the inclusion criteria, we really needed to focus in on the largest or the highest risk population. So similar to the strength trial, they looked at patients above the age of 45 with established cardiovascular disease or those above 50 years who were diabetic with at least greater than one additional risk factor. They had to have a fasting triglyceride level from 135 to 499 and an LDL cholesterol level from 41 to 100, despite being on a stable dose of statins, regardless of the intensity for greater than or equal to four weeks. And what was really phenomenal was is that now we actually did see that the reduce it study actually led to a pretty notable reduction in the composite primary endpoint of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, stroke, coronary revascularization, or unstable angina. And that's specifically a relative risk reduction of over of almost a quarter, 25%, and an absolute risk reduction of 4.8%. The same can be seen actually when you look at it from the secondary um, endpoint, which is overall cardiovascular death, MI, and stroke, where there was a notable statistically significant relative risk reduction of 26.5% and an absolute risk reduction of 3.6%. What I want to stress is that this actually came with very rare side effects or very few side effects. And the common side effects that were really noted were either be it diarrhea, peripheral edema, constipation, anemia, as well as atrial fibrillation. And one thing I want to stress is that the side effects seen with the use of this agent versus the use of the agent in the strength trial was actually similar when it comes to the increased risk of new onset atrial fibrillation, where it was about 2.2% of the population in the treatment arm versus 1.3% of the population in the controlled arm. There also was a higher rate as alluded to of these more GI adverse events such as diarrhea or constipation or upset stomach as an example. But the most notable thing is, is that it was overall well treated. But I do think it's important to highlight that from a risk versus benefit perspective, thinking in the back of our mind that there may be a slightly higher abundance of atrial fibrillation may paint the picture of who we may want to consider using this agent in versus who we may want to consider not using this agent in. Now, what I do think is important to highlight as well, and what this study and other studies have proven is that although the 
acosapin ethyl did a phenomenal job in lowering triglyceride levels. We know that lowering triglyceride levels alone does not fully explain the cardiovascular risk reduction that we are most recently seeing. Well, how do we know that? The fact is, is that our older agents that we've used in the past to lower triglyceride levels, such as niacin and fibrates, as I brought up before, have not demonstrated any cardiovascular risk reduction. And if anything, in combination with statins may actually show higher rates of adverse effects, such as myopathy, as an example. And the strength trial, which is a landmark trial that I brought up that eventually led to be uh, being stopped because they thought it was a futile, that as well did not show any cardiovascular outcomes in terms of lowering the risk of the primary endpoint, despite driving down that triglyceride level. However, in reduce it with the use of acosapin ethyl or the brand name being Vicepa, we know that that lowered the risk of cardiovascular disease, but it also lowered the risk of triglyceride levels. But more impactfully, it lowered the risk of cardiovascular disease greater than it lowered the risk of triglyceride levels, where as an example, there was a relative risk reduction of 25% in the first occurrence of a MACE event and a 30% reduction in first recurrence as well as re recurrence of a MACE event with a triglyceride lowering of about 20% versus placebo. This was very similar in a trial that was actually studied in Japan called the Jealous Study that used just similarly to the reduced trial, a purified version of EPA. And it demonstrated a 19% risk reduction in patients essentially that had normal triglyceride levels and only a 5% lowering of their triglyceride levels, suggesting that perhaps the effects of EPA go beyond triglyceride lowering itself. As I alluded to with that diagram earlier, there are differences, at least in terms of how these fatty acids get into the cell. We'll re-explore that in a little bit, but we also know that there are other differences. When it comes to DHA and EPA, we know that it can drive down the triglycerides as well as the non-HDL cholesterol, but DHA, interestingly enough, with the use of EPA may increase LDL levels, especially in those who have very high triglyceride and low HDA levels whereas EPA does not raise and may actually decrease LDL. This was found in the actual reduced it trial, where in those patients who drug, whose triglyceride levels were ranging from 200 to 500 milligrams per deciliter, and they were treated with a statin, and they were started on a purified EPA formula, they actually had a decrease in their LDL concentration by about 6%, which is similar to doubling the dose of a statin, so very impactful. We also know that when it comes to DHA plus EPA, there could be varying effects on apolipoprotein B. When we think about the apolipoprotein B concentration, we know that it's an indirect measurement of the number of LDL particles, and it has been suggested that ApoB may actually be a better measure of the atherogen atherogenic potential of serum LDL and that uh, and that even compared to LDL concentration itself especially when triglyceride levels are greater than 200 and non HDL actually reflects um, ApoB containing particles a lot better than other other parts of the lipid panel. But what is interesting to see is that DHA plus EPA has varying effects on ApoB, but EPA alone actually has been shown to lower ApoB too. So EPA lowering LDL cholesterol, lowering ApoB. In the reduced trial, we also saw that it leads led to lower rates of inflammatory markers in the sense that it lowered high sensitivity CRP, whereas the use of DHA did not consistently affect the levels of CRP. And as I alluded to before, the mechanistic approach to it with the variations in how it enters the cell membrane may also play a role. Going back to this graph here or this figure, seeing again EPA coming in in a very straight line where it stabilizes the membrane and from a DHA perspective, coming in more curvature where it destabilizes the membrane may also play a role. So it seems to me that the bigger answer or the bigger question really comes to play is, although EPA might be where the action is in terms of benefit, we need to have future studies out there that actually explore the mechanisms for these differences or benefits. And it's so necessary and pivotal. And a better question and a better approach, going back to that first graph that I showed, where we have a varying number of things right now that we can choose from to lower our cardiovascular risk is, if you have a patient 
who's on a maximally tolerated statin plus azetamide with mildly elevated triglyceride levels and an LDL level that is persistently mildly elevated, do you go to what's next on the guidelines, a PCSK9 inhibitor, or do you consider the use of a purified EPA agent such as icosapin ethyl, which is FDA approved? Well, the fact is both drugs are associated with favorable ASCVD outcomes, but when you actually compare their efficacy, we have not done that. We have not had head to head trials. And it really brings the, the point that with all of these different agents that we have coming out there, focusing on platelets, focusing on metabolism, we need to do head to head. So it could hopefully be an easier approach for us as clinicians to decide what would the next best approach be. We live right now in an era where multiple medications have shown to improve cardiovascular outcomes. And right now what we're doing is really thinking from a clinician perspective is choosing what the right medication for each patient is. And we know that a lot of times that does come down to the importance of shared decision-making. So we wanna make sure that we're choosing the right medication for the right patient, but we also wanna be thoughtful that we're looking at the cost and figuring out what the payers will cover. Because in this day and age, that's also important too. And it unfortunately may dictate, may dictate what we have access to or what our patients more importantly have access to. But I love the fact that we now have an area where we could expand and consider the use of multiple agents. What I think we really need to work on though is what's that stepwise approach and realizing that not every patient is um, exactly the same. So what we may use for one may very well may be different for the other. So in summary, and really the take home points that I wanted to stress with this talk, which again, focused a lot on the use of fish oil, and more importantly, the FDA, or the FDA approved acosapin ethyl is there is residual cardiovascular risk that remains even despite standard treatment. That standard treatment, of course, includes lifestyle, but we also have to think about from a medication perspective with the fact we really always need to target that LDL first, that statin therapies are there. Options for cardiovascular risk reduction have changed as well. As I alluded to, possibly targeting omega-3 fatty acid and lowering the triglyceride levels may be the next approach. The role of diet and exercise, which is the cornerstone of therapy, I really do believe needs to be better explored further in these patients that have elevated triglycerides specific for these trials. Because one thing that I do believe was a slight limitation in the reduced trial was, is that they were not on an intense dietary intervention. So it brings to really the question, perhaps if more careful attention was given to counseling on heart healthy diet and exercise, fewer patients might actually need icosapin ethyl because we not only see improvements in our lipid panel, such as our triglyceride levels, but we also see improvements in cardiovascular outcomes just through lifestyle alone. So using that, I believe, as another, uh, another uh, point of action for us and our patients is really important. And at this time, perhaps we really need to be cautious. And I think that's the take home of this talk more importantly than anything, that perhaps we need to be cautious about using fatty acids that contain DHA containing compo compounds. And we maybe should be moving more towards fatty acids that are using just that purified e EPA in certain patients that have hypertriglyceridemia who are maximally treated with statins, but still maintain a high risk overall for cardiovascular disease. And with that, I thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here today. I look forward to answering any questions or concerns that you may have had. And more importantly, I think that what this talk really gives us an opportunity to talk about is more of really thinking about from our perspective, every patient again, we can't just put them in a box. Every patient is individual. And I'm really hopeful that we now have different tools that we can use to lower their overall cardiovascular risk. I think what we as clinicians have to really have a better idea about is when should we use those tools and when should we not? So thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Bond. Our next presentation will be Ms. Chloe D. Villavaso. She's an advanced practice nurse and a clinical nurse specialist at the Tulane University School of Medicine Heart and Vascular Institute. She presently is the TAVA coordinator and a clinical specialist in cardiology preventive medicine. Chloe is going to discuss best practices for pharmacotherapeutic approaches to hypertension. Thank you, Dr. Bond. 
I would like to thank Dr. Ferdinand and the organizers for allowing me to present best practices for pharmacotherapeutic approaches to hypertension. I have no disclosures. And the objectives are to describe hypertension burden and risk factors, explain the guideline drug therapy and role of diuretics, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, and angiotensin receptor blockers, review aldosterone antagonists in resistant hypertension, and describe evidence-based approaches to improve the treatment and control of hypertension. We'll begin with three pretest questions. Number one, which of the following is true regarding chlorothaladone? A, same thiazide structure as hydrochlorothiazide. B, half-life 45 to 60 hours. C, less likely causes hypokalemia and hyperuricemia than hydrochlorothiazide. Or D, not effective to lower blood pressure at any GFR less than 60. Number two, which of the following is true regarding angiotensin receptor blockers? A, less blood pressure lowering effectiveness versus ACE inhibitors. B, similar blood pressure lowering with diuretic combination in African-Americans versus white patients. C, ARBs cause equal angioedema as ACE inhibitors. And D, better cardiovascular outcomes with ARBs and ACE inhibitor combination versus either alone. Number three, which is true of the blood pressure lowering effectiveness of spironolactone versus other agents in resistant hypertension? A, spironolactone is similar in blood pressure lowering as doxacycin. B, Spironolactone is contraindicated with GFR less than 60. C, spironolactone is more effective per milligram than eplorinone. Or D, no superiority of spironolactone versus other agents in resistant hypertension. The diagnosis and treatment of hypertension are important because hypertension can result in target organ damage, including left ventricular hypertrophy, coronary heart disease, heart failure, atrial fibrillation, chronic kidney disease, peripheral arterial disease, retinopathy, TIA, stroke, and dementia. This is a more recent depiction released by the CDC of the health problems caused by hypertension. Beginning at one o'clock, there's cognitive decline, heart failure, kidney disease, sexual dysfunction, peripheral arterial disease, pregnancy-related complications, heart attack, vision loss, and stroke. Over the years, there has been a decline in the rate of blood pressure control. When the newer hypertension cutoff of 130 over 80 is used, we see an increased prevalence of hypertension amongst whites, blacks, Asians, and Hispanics, with non-Hispanic blacks having an increased rate of hypertension of nearly 60%. These are the categories of blood pressure. Stage one hypertension begins with a systolic blood pressure of 130, or a diastolic blood pressure of 80. And in patients with high cardiac risk and diabetes, the treatment goal is blood pressure less than 130 over 80. Before medications are initiated and during the treatment of hypertension, diet modification should be encouraged. The largest mediator in the difference between the rates of hypertension amongst blacks and whites is the Southern diet. This diet is high in processed foods, sodium, sugar, sugar sweetened beverages, and saturated fat. It's important to remember there are medications that can interfere with blood pressure control, including 
NSAIDs, decongestants, diet pills, illicit drugs, alcohol, cyclosporine, erythropoietin, natural licorice, and herbal compounds such as ephedra. These are the basic laboratory tests used in patients with hypertension. Includes a basic metabolic panel, complete blood count, lipid profile, thyroid stimulating hormone test, urinalysis, and ECG. In patients with severe hypertension, an echocardiogram can be ordered. The ACC AHA multi-society guideline on hypertension was released in 2017. These are the drug classes used to treat hypertension with the first line therapeutic agents highlighted, including the thiazide and loop diuretics, calcium channel blockers, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, and the angiotensin receptor blockers. The guidelines recommend initial treatment for blacks should include a thiazide type diuretic or a calcium channel blocker. Oftentimes, two or more antihypertensive medications are needed to achieve a blood pressure less than 130 over 80. This is especially true in Black patients. And although ACE inhibitors and ARBs are less effective in Blacks as monotherapy when compared with whites, when these agents are combined with a, thi with a diuretic or a calcium channel blocker, they're equally effective as in Blacks as in whites. We'll begin with the thiazide or thiazide type diuretics. Chlorthalidone is preferred because it has a longer half-life. Indapamide is available in a low-dose 1.25 milligram tablet given once daily, and it is available at most drugstores. Patients on these medications should be monitored for electrolyte imbalances and the uric acid level should be monitored. This chart compares chlorothaladone to hydrochlorothiazide. Chlorothaladone has a half-life of 45 to 60 hours. It's one and a half to two times as potent as hydrochlorothiazide, but it is more likely to cause hypokalemia and hyperuricemia. The loop diuretics are preferred over the thiazide diuretics in patients with severe kidney disease, GFR less than 30. Ferrosamide is commonly used and torsamide has a longer half-life. The potassium sparing diuretics, amylaride and triamterine are not as effective in blood pressure lowering and should be avoided in patients with a GFR less than 45. The next class of drugs we'll discuss are the calcium channel blockers. They work by blocking the influx of calcium into the cell, which re results in vasodilation and blood pressure lowering. They also decrease excitability and contractility of the myocardium. There are two types of calcium channel blockers, the dihydropyridines, which are vasoselective, used primarily in the treatment of hypertension, and the non-dihydropyridines, which are cardioselective and vasoselective, used to treat hypertension, but primarily used in the treatment of tachyarrhythmias and vasospasms. Of the dihydropyridines, amylodipine is commonly used. Calcium channel blockers should be avoided in patients with heart failure, severe aortic stenosis, unstable angina, and acute myocardial infarction. They can be associated with peripheral edema because of the vasodilatory effects of calcium channel blockers. If a patient develops peripheral edema, the dose of the medication can be decreased. This may be effective. Diltiazem and verapamil can be used to treat hypertension, but should not be used in combination with a beta blocker and should not be used in patients with heart failure. The next groups of drugs act on the renin angiotensin system. The direct renin inhibitor, aliscarin, works by blocking the conversion of angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1 by way of renin. 
the ACE inhibitors block the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 by blocking the angiotensin converting enzyme. When the angiotensin converting enzyme is blocked, bradykinin levels can increase. This is why patients that are on ACE inhibitors may develop a cough or angioedema. And the angiotensin receptor blockers work at the AT1 receptor site to block angiotensin II, a potent vasoconstrictor. Further down the pathway, the aldosterone antagonists block sodium and fluid retention. The direct renin inhibitor, aliscarin, has a very long half-life of 24 hours. It is not to be used in combination with an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker. There is an increased risk of hyperkalemia in patients with CKD and patients on potassium supplements. And aliscarin can cause acute renal failure in patients with severe bilateral artery, renal artery stenosis. Aliscarin should be avoided in pregnancy. This is a list of the ACE inhibitors. Prescribing an ACE inhibitor with a longer half-life given once daily is effective in lowering blood pressure. ACE inhibitors should not be combined with an angiotensin receptor blocker or a direct renin inhibitor. And when an ACE inhibitor is started, the renal function and electrolytes should be checked seven to 10 days after the medication is initiated. There's an increased risk of renal failure in patients with bilateral renal artery stenosis. And if a patient has a history of angioedema on an ACE inhibitor, then ACE inhibitors are contraindicated. ACE inhibitors should not be used in patients that are pregnant. Angioedema is more common in black patients. And it's important to remember that angioedema can occur at any time during treatment with an ACE inhibitor, even after long-term use. This is a medical emergency and the ACE inhibitor should be discontinued immediately. This is a list of the angiotensin receptor blockers. Similarly to the ACE inhibitors, prescribing an angiotensin receptor blocker with a longer half-life given once daily is effective at lowering blood pressure. ARBs should not be combined with an ACE inhibitor or a direct renin inhibitor, and the kidney function and electrolytes should be checked one week after starting an ARB. There is a, an increased risk of renal failure in patients with uh, severe bilateral renal artery stenosis. And if a patient has a history of cough on an ACE inhibitor, an angiotensin receptor blocker is an alternative. Patients with a history of angioedema on an ACE inhibitor can be prescribed an ARB, but you must wait at least six weeks and the patient and be pre prepared to stop the ARB if needed. Do not give ARBs to pregnant patients. The aldosterone antagonists, eplorinone and spironolactone. Spironolactone is more effective on a milligram per milligram basis, but it is associated with a greater risk of gynecomastia and impotence because it stimulates the estrogen receptors. This study shows that spironolactone is most effective at lowering blood pressure in patients that are resistant, that have resistant hypertension. Spironolactone in this study was compared to placebo, doxycycline, and bisoprolol. The alpha blockers are commonly prescribed in patients with prostate hypertrophy. Remember that when prescribing these medications, the patient can develop orthostatic hypotension with the first dose. The direct vasodilators, hydralazine and minoxidil, are associated with sodium and water retention, tachycardia, hydralazine is associated with the lupus-like syndrome, and minoxidil is a drug that's given for hair growth. So when prescribing this medication for patients that are hypertensive, there is a risk of unwanted hair growth. For instance, women may develop hair on their chest or face. The central alpha agonists and other centrally acting drugs are listed here. These medications are usually reserved as last line therapy because of the central nervous system effects. 
Clonidine can cause dry mouth and drowsiness. And clonidine should not be abruptly discontinued because a patient can have a rebound hypertensive crisis. The clonidine patch is an alternative to oral clonidine. It's applied once weekly. Beta blockers work by blocking beta-1 receptors in the heart, beta-2 in the lungs, and the alpha-1 adrenergic receptors in the blood vessels. Of the cardioselective beta blockers, atenolol is the least effective at lowering blood pressure. Beta blockers are not recommended as first-line therapeutic agents for hypertension unless a patient has ischemic heart disease or a heart failure. The cardioselective beta blockers are preferred in patients with bronchospastic airway disease because these agents block beta-1 receptors. Metoprolol succinate and bisoprolol are preferred in, in patients with heart failure. When prescribing metoprolol succinate, you can write for ER. This will help to ensure that the patient receives metoprolol succinate as opposed to metoprolol tartrate. Nabevolol is cardioselective and vasodilatory and effective in lowering blood pressure. The non-cardioselective beta blockers are avoided in patients with reactive airway disease. This is because these medications block beta-2 receptors, resulting in bronchoconstriction. In carvedilol, it blocks both alpha and beta receptors and is pre preferred in patients with heart failure. Beta blockers should not be discontinued abruptly. In 2018, the AHA released the scientific statement on resistant hypertension. Resistant hypertension is defined as blood pressure greater than or equal to 130 over 80 in patients adhering to three or more antihypertensive medication agents from different classes at optimal doses. When managing a patient with resistant hypertension, the first step includes excluding secondary causes, white coat hypertension, and ensuring medication adherence. It also includes ensuring that the patient is adhering to a low sodium heart healthy diet and that lifestyle interventions are maximized. The third part of the first step is to optimize the three drug regimen of a RAS blocker, calcium channel blocker, and diuretic. Step two is to substitute the diuretic for chlorothaladone or endapamide. Step three is to add spironolactone or eplowernone. Step four is to add a beta blocker if it's appropriate. If a beta blocker is contraindicated, then the clonidine patch can be considered. Step five is to add hydralazine. And step six is to substitute hydralazine for minoxidil. Medication adherence is key in the treatment of hypertension. Prescribing a single pill combination is very effective. It's less burdensome on the patient. They can take one pill as opposed to two or three. There's one copay, and there are fewer titration steps with a single pill combination. This is a list of strategies to improve hypertension treatment and control. Team-based care involves healthcare providers, the patient and patient's family and friends. Shared decision-making should always be implemented. This is where patients are educated on hypertension and the various treatment options, and the provider and the patient come to an agreement on the best treatment plan, taking into consideration the patient's beliefs on treatment. Team-based approach also includes educating patients on selecting a validated blood pressure monitor. Patients can access validatebp.org to get a list of validated monitors. And in clinics, blood pressure monitors should be recalibrated according to the manufacturer's recommendation. 
These are educational resources available through the Association of Black Cardiologists that can be shared with patients. And the Preventive Cardiovascular Nurses Association also has patient and provider resources available. It's important to accurately diagnose and treat hypertension. And to do this, blood pressure technique must be appropriate. Patients should not eat, drink, smoke, or ingest caffeine or exercise 30 minutes before their blood pressure is taken. Their bladder should be empty. They should not talk for at least five minutes. Back should be supported, feet flat on the floor, legs uncrossed. The cuff should be the correct size, applied to the bare arm, and the arm should be supported at heart level. Here we can see many errors in blood pressure measurement. Infographics such as this are available through the CDC, AHA, and other organizations and should be posted in areas where blood pressure is taken. This way, healthcare providers along with patients are reminded on the correct way to measure blood pressure. Now we'll move on to the post-test questions. Number one, which of the following is true regarding chlorthalidone? The correct answer is B, half-life of 45 to 60 hours. Number two, which of the following is true regarding angiotensin receptor blockers? The correct answer is B, similar blood pressure lowering with diuretic combination in African-Americans versus white patients. And number three, which is true of the blood pressure lowering effectiveness of spironolactone versus other agents in resistant hypertension? C, spironolactone is more effective per milligram than eplowernone. In conclusion, hypertension is a continuous direct risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Lifestyle modification should always be encouraged the first line drug therapy for the treatment of hypertension includes calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors, or angiotensin receptor blockers and diuretics. The medications used in resistant hypertension include the mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, spironolactone and eplowernone. And a team-based approach should be implemented to achieve blood pressure treatment and control. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Villavaso. We're now going to take a 10 minute break. Please ensure you are back in 10 minutes. I'm going to present new and emerging agents for LDLC and lipoprotein little a. Thank you. Welcome back everyone. If you have joined us late, please note we will have a full discussion with all of the faculty at the conclusion of all presentations. Please continue to submit your questions or comments in the Q&A box, and we will address them at that time. I'm pleased to present new and emerging agents for lowering LDLC and lipoprotein little a. Here are my disclosures. First, I'll discuss the relationship between LDLC, lipoprotein A, and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Then we'll discuss mechanisms for LDLC reduction in the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway. We'll highlight safety and efficacy of approved agents for LDLC reduction, discuss statin intolerance, and then review data on some of the newer agents, azetamide, the, the PCSK9 inhibitors, and bimpadoic acid. Finally, we will highlight issues related to medication costs, access, and disparities by sex, race, and ethnicity. Atherosclerosis is the main underlying cause of ASCVD and the direct relationship between elevated LDLC cholesterol and the presentation of cholesterol plaque formation and eventually events has been well documented. However, there are now newer forms of cholesterol which have been seen to be predictive of a high risk. One is called lipoprotein A or lipoprotein little a. 
is an atherogenic LDL-like lipoprotein that's produced in the liver. It's unique because it has associated with the LDL-type substance Kringles, little proteins, which increase thrombicity and the ability to cause clots. I was pleased to be part of a National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute working group that looked at some of the recommendations on what we need to do to further investigate lipoprotein A and its relationship to cardiovascular disease and aortic stenosis. One of the things we identified is that lipoprotein A or LP little a comes out of the liver and then deposits throughout the vasculature, including the carotid arteries, the aortic valve itself, the peripheral arteries, and the coronary arteries. Another thing that's been investigated is that the presence of elevated lipoprotein A is seen in all populations throughout the globe but it is higher in persons of African descent and patients of South Asian descent. The LPA gene in African-Americans appears to be associated with an increased risk related to elevated lipoprotein A. Going around this circle are some of the various conditions directly related to elevated LPA including coronary heart disease, aortic valve disease, peripheral vascular disease, and stroke. LPA indeed has unique aspects in African-Americans. Recent studies have shown it's associated with ASCVD risk. It is a continuous risk and there's no threshold. It's not dependent on high LDLC or non-HDLC or other cardiovascular risk factors. Therefore, if you have an African-American patient with premature cardiovascular disease or coronary heart disease that is not explained by conventional lipid factors or other risk factors, consider LPA. There are three major mechanisms for LDL lowering that are presently being utilized. Of course, we have the statins that block cholesterol synthesis in the liver azetamide number two that blocks the absorption of cholesterol in the intestines and the PCSK9 inhibitors that increase LDL receptors by blocking their degradation in the liver. All of these lead to a decrease in LDL cholesterol. Their effects appear to be independent and to some degree additive in terms of the ability to lower LDL cholesterol. The first step is the use of high intensity appropriate statins, including atorvastatin 40 or 80 or rosuvastatin 20 or 40, specifically in high risk patients who have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. In some patients, modern intensity may be needed. However, in high risk patients, high intensity statins are guideline recommended for decreasing atherosclerotic risk. This is based on multiple large outcomes trials. In the green, we see the placebo-controlled stock trials with statins starting in the 1994 era onward to presently. These trials have confirmed that lowering LDL cholesterol with statins decreases risk. Furthermore, comparison of statin dose trials have shown that high-intensity statins are the best way to reduce risk in high-risk patients. Azetamide now has also been shown to have an additive effect added to statin therapy. And we're gonna hear about a new agent which does not yet have cardiovascular outcomes but appears to lower LDL cholesterol called bimpadoic acid. And we will hear about the PCSK9 inhibitors when added to maximally tolerated statins appear to improve cardiovascular outcomes and robustly lower LDL cholesterol. Now, one of the concerns with many clinicians are the statin side effects. Let's briefly do an overview of some of the side effects related to statins. Statins may cause new onset diabetes, 
This is more frequent in patients who have obesity, fasting glucose in the prediabetes range, or metabolic syndrome. These predisposing factors, however, does not mean that you do not use statin therapy as indicated. We know that statins can cause muscle aches or myalgia. It's relatively infrequent in clinical trials, but in clinical medicine, it may be found to be more frequent, as much as 5 to 10% or even greater in observational studies. There are multiple risk factors for myalgias, including increased age, female status, low body weight, the use of other high-risk medications, comorbid conditions such as hypothyroidism, pre-existing myopathy, persons of Asian descent, excessive alcohol, and high levels of physical activity or trauma. More rare is myositis or myopathy with CK levels 10 times the upper limits of normal. And very rare is rhabdomyolysis with CKs not only 10 times the upper limits of normal, but with renal injury. Liver enzyme elevations can be seen, but actual hepatic failure due to statins is quite rare. Statins really have not been proven to show memory or cognition difficulties, although that's been reported on the internet. And there's no definite association with cancer, renal function, cataracts, tendon rupture, hemorrhagic strokes, interstitial lung disease, or low testosterone. If a patient does have an increase in glucose on high intensity statins, it's recommended now that we continue statin therapy. In fact, patients who have diabetes have an indication for the use of statins. Adherence to the statins, even with new onset diabetes, leads to a net clinical benefit. Of course, patients should also participate in moderate physical activity, maintain a healthy diet, and sustain moderate weight loss. If the patient has muscle aches due to statins, we should reassess and perhaps rechallenge, even using a different statin. Also note that alternative statins or a combination with non-statin therapy may additionally lower LDLC and avoid some of the muscle symptoms. Of course, it's important before starting statins to identify the potential predisposing factors which we covered that may actually be more related to myopathy. So we've discussed the effects of statin therapy in terms of decreasing ASCVD risk, especially high intensity statins in very high risk patients. Now let's look at the benefits of azetamide. It blocks the absorption of cholesterol in the small intestines through a beneficial effect on the Newman pick C1L1 type protein associated with the absorption of cholesterol. Azetamide adds to statins to reduce LDLC cholesterol and reduces risk for coronary artery disease. The study that showed an improvement of lowering residual risk was called improvement with azetamide, showing an absolute difference of 15.8 milligrams per deciliter and a decrease in cardiovascular endpoints when added to maximally tolerated simvastatin. Therefore, the addition of azetamide to statins may give additional benefit beyond statins alone. Along with azetamide, we now have the PCSK9 inhibitors, which are given by injection. The PCSK9 itself is a protein that chaperones the LDL particle in its receptor inside the liver where it is broken down. Therefore, if you block the PCSK9 or inhibit with monoclonal antibodies, there is a less urgency to break down the LDL receptors. More LDL receptors are now available at the liver site such that the LDL cholesterol can be brought back into the liver, lowering the LDLC levels. The PCSK9 inhibitors have been shown to reduce residual risk. Note these studies with alaricumab that have shown a decrease in LDL levels of 48.1 milligrams per deciliter or 54.7% and a statistically significant reduction in cardiovascular compositive endpoints. 
Here's a study with another PCSK9 inhibitor, Evolocumab, also showing very robust reduction in the LDLC levels and a statistically significant reduction in the composite cardiovascular endpoint. Now, looking at these PCSK9 inhibitor cardiovascular outcomes trials, it should be noted that these patients were middle aged and older, most on high intensity statins, 69% with evolocumab, 89% with alarecumab. Very few won no statins at all, and only a small percentage were on azetamide. We will revisit this concept of the PCSK9 inhibitors working even without azetamide. Also note, with the robust reduction of the LDLC cholesterol, there appears to be no threshold for which it is not beneficial. The PCSK9 inhibitors, therefore, continue to demonstrate that lower is better, even at very low levels of LDLC cholesterol. Who are these patients that would benefit from adding a PCSK9 inhibitor to statins? It includes patients with multiple major atherosclerotic cardiovascular events, including acute coronary syndrome, MI, stroke, or peripheral arterial disease. Or it could be a patient who just has one major event, but also has multiple high-risk conditions. And note that includes age, smoking, history of CHF, coronary interventions, heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, that's a genetic condition with very high LDLs, usually over 190, diabetes, hypertension, persistently elevated LDL, or chronic kidney disease. These multiple high risk factors are very common in our patients. This is from the more recent cholesterol guideline, and it suggests in these very high risk patients, there's no age specific recommendations. However, it may be beneficial to add a PCSK9 to maximally tolerated statins plus azetamide. In their algorithm, once the patient is defined as very high risk, a PCSK9 can be inhibited. Here is the clinical algorithm that suggests a benefit in reducing ASCBD in very high risk patients as we previously defined. There's the option of adding the PCSK9 inhibitor to maximally tolerated statins plus azetamide. Note that the PCSK9 inhibitor in the green should be added after azetamide and maximally tolerated statins as a class one evidence. It should be indicated to start this type of therapy if the LDLC cholesterol is equal to or greater than 70 in very high risk patients. Let's move on now to a newer form of LDL reduction, pempadoic acid. So we've discussed high intensity statins and their benefit, and we've also looked at azetamide that blocks the absorption of cholesterol in the intestine. Now let's look at a more recently approved class of agents, liver specific ATP citrate lysase inhibition with bimpadoic acid. Bimpadoic acid is not a statin, it's a prodrug activated in the liver. It inhibits the synthesis of cholesterol in the liver at the ATP citrate lysase enzyme level. This is different from the statin, which works at the HMG-CoA reductase level. However, by reducing the formulation of cholesterol in the liver, it increases LDL receptors, which increases LDL clearance, and leads to a decrease in plasma LDL cholesterol. Bimpadoic acid with or without azetamide was FDA approved in 2020 as an adjunct to diet and maximally tolerated statin for treatment of patients who have heterozygous hypercholesterolemia, which is a genetic form of high cholesterol, or who have established ASCVD and acquire additional LDL reduction. Despite approval of bimpadoic acid by the FDA, however, the data were based on cohorts, which were over 95% self-identified non-Hispanic white adults, with only 3% non-Hispanic black adults, 1% Asian adults, 
and 3% Hispanic Latinx adults, 1% other races. Liver-specific ATP citrate lysase inhibition by bimpedoic acid, therefore, leads to a decrease in LDL cholesterol and may attenuate atherosclerosis. Bimpedoic acid is a prodrug which must be converted in the liver by a very long chain acyl-CoA synthetase 1. Skeletal muscle does not express the ability to convert the prodrug to active drug. Therefore, bimpedoic acid does not suppress cholesterol synthesis or associated biological intermediates that are required for normal muscle function and does not promote associated toxicity. Let's look at some of the data related to cholesterol lowering via bimpedoic acid. Here are five randomized controlled double-blind placebo-controlled multi-center trials that have established the safety tolerability and LDL lowering efficacy of bimpedoic acid or bimpedoic acid in combination with azetamide. In the largest of the trial, known as Clear Harmony, of over 2,000 patients with ASCVD or heterozygous FH with background statin therapy, there was a significant reduction in LDL cholesterol. 16.5% bipedoic acid reduction of LDLC versus placebo over one year. There was one unique side effect that was gout which was reported in 1.5% of bimpedoic acid and 0.4% of placebo. Therefore, patients who have a history of gout may merit monitoring, especially with elevated uric acid. Also in the package insert for bimpedoic acid is noted an association with increased risk of tendon rupture injury. It was found in 0.5% with bimpedoic acid and 0% with placebo. Multiple tenders were involved, including the rotator cuff, biceps, and Achilles, and appeared to happen within weeks to months after starting bimpedoic acid. There were multiple risk factors for tendon rupture, and it is now in the label to consider alternative treatment from bimpedoic acid in patients who have a history of tendon disorders or tendon rupture. What will the LDLC and lipoprotein lowering agents show in the future? Well, no one knows. We do know now with statins, there persist disparities despite the presence of generics. There have been health disparities in black patients with ASABD in several studies. For instance, in the Southeast, one called Regards and over 18,000 patients saw low use of statins by black patients, especially those who lived in poverty or lacked insurance. Furthermore, even in the Northeast, in one outpatient inner city population, patients who were statin eligible, there was lower statin prescription rates noted for black patients, especially younger black patients. With the PCSK9 inhibitors, which can be quite costly, it has been shown that those patients who have rejection, abandonment, or disparities in use have higher cardiovascular outcomes if PCSK9 inhibitors are needed. However, the impact of cardiovascular outcomes on high rates of prescription denials and abandonment has been shown more with women, minorities, those with lower education or lower incomes, all of which were less likely to receive approval for PCSK9 inhibitors or were less likely to fill an approved prescription. In conclusion, we've shown that Lipoprotein A and LDLC are both causal for ASCVD. We now have statin therapy, which is low cost and safely reduces ASCVD events. The absolute benefit of statins, especially high intensity statins in very high risk patients, is directly related to the absolute LDLC reduction. Furthermore, adding azetamide gives modest further reductions in LDLC and cardiovascular risk. PCSK9 inhibitors can be tolerated and added to maximally tolerated statins to further lower LDLC and give at least moderate cardiovascular risk reduction. A more recent agent, bimpedoic acid, can be an additional LDLC lowering medication 
and can be even used in patients who are intolerant of statins. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss these important emerging concepts. My Twitter account is there at KCFerdMD. Our next presentation will be advances in managing hyperlipidemia and hypertension, medication versus plant-based implications. Our presenter will be Dr. Columbus Batiste. He's director of the SCPMG Regional Home-Based Cardiac Rehab Program and assistant professor at the University of California, Riverside School of Medicine. Dr. Batiste is president of the Inland Empire chapter of the American Heart Association Board of Directors and he's a plant-based cardiologist. Hello, my name is Columbus Batiste and I bring you greetings from Southern California, Kaiser Permanente. And it's a pleasure to speak with you on this all important topic as it relates to advancements in managing hyperlipidemia and hypertension medications versus plant-based implications. You know, for this talk, I have no disclosures. And what's so interesting is that, you know, as we begin, to reflect on science and come out of 2020, it's really challenging to discuss chronic disease or any illness without looking through the lens of 2020. You know, I'm, uh, I'm almost beginning to discuss disease somewhat uh, as it relates to BC before COVID and AC after COVID in terms of designation. But as I really truly look at 2020 and what we've all come through as it relates to the sars cov crises and pandemic is that 2020 really exposed, it exposed so many things inside of our society and our healthcare system. You know, COVID exposed the fact that disease begets disease. Uh, what we saw during COVID is we saw that there was a relationship between chronic diseases like hypertension, obesity, chronic kidney disease, and lung diseases that increase one's susceptibility to this thing called COVID that we had never really heard of or focused on previously. You know, despite the innovation, our technology, the brain power that exists in America, the one thing that came blaring clear was the fact that Americans, all Americans, have a history of living sicker and dying sooner than people in other countries. Uh, if you don't don't believe me, you just look no further than our, our esteemed uh, journal, New England Journal of Medicine, that looked at trends in chronic disease management over the past uh, 20 years or so. And this recently reported New England Journal article, it confirmed what other studies have been showing for many decades. It showed that our control for blood sugar, our diabetes, seems to be lagging. It's declining for an ideal or a more optimal hemoglobin A1C less than 7%, right? And seeing that those with uh, uh, those issues are still uh, profound. We see too as well that blood pressure control seemed to be declining. And this became a major issue and was brought forth by our Surgeon General. When we look as a toll, we see that not only all of the combined risk factors for cardiovascular ailments like what you and I treat have been impacted, A1C, blood pressure, cholesterol are all lagging. They're declining in terms of the level of control. But once again, this is not new. This is something that we have known. As a matter of fact, when the U.S. is compared to other industrialized countries, we have the highest burden of chronic disease. There's no doubt about it. When we look at the other industrialized countries, we see too as well that we have the highest average uh, burden, uh, disease burden caused by cardiovascular disease compared to other countries. We see too as well, we have the highest rates of obesity. We have as well, the highest expenditures. We spend more money, but yet we have poor quality. And studies are really defining and comparing the quality of our healthcare inside the United States to other areas. And COVID really truly exposed this fact as we saw our numbers skyrocketed in terms of death and infections that were uh, persistent inside the country. We see too as well that the life expectancy, so not only are we living sicker, but we're dying sooner. That the life expectancy inside the United States, which is multifactorial, is one of the lags behind other industrialized countries. We're living sicker and dying sooner. But 2020 not only exposed this, it exposed another dirty little secret. It exposed 
to as well the more gruesome secret that racism still persists, that racism persists inside the medical community and outside the medical community. It showed beyond a shadow of a doubt that there were disparities that impacted certain subgroups of Americans more than others. Most exposed were those who were black and brown hue, African Americans and Latinos. Is what was shown that we live the sickest and die the soonest as it relates to COVID virus, but this extends beyond this. The CDC Centers for Disease Control has reported for years the impact of high blood pressure disparities at all age groups in the 20s, in the 40s, and in the 60s, that the higher incidence of high blood pressure, diabetes, and stroke, living sicker, but also reporting the fact that at every age group, we are also dying sooner. All of this came to a head as we reflected on 2020, as I'm continuing to do right now, and the impact of COVID. We saw that COVID really shaved years of life off of all Americans. But who was most impacted were those who, of African descent. We saw the greatest number of, of, of impact on longevity. Once again, this is not new. Studies have been done Previously, looking at disparities in health outcomes based on location and zip codes, and this was classically written in what was known as the Eight Americas, uh, defined by race, your county location, socioeconomic uh, features of each county, really played a role in what we call social determinants of health. And that 2020, once again, brought to light another New England Journal article showing that the impact of social determinants of health, which is where, we, where we're born, where we live, where we're, we're raised and we play and pray, that all these, these components of our neighborhoods plays a significant role in our disease development. It plays a significant role in obesity as well as what we say we're showing, the outcomes for COVID-19. It told us that we were in a crisis. We knew we were in a crisis in 2020. There's no doubt about it. 2020 revealed the state of health in the United States is in crises. But when I really look closer at this word crisis, I was reflecting on, on a, 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 a speech by John F. Kennedy, and he brought this to my attention years ago as I, I looked at this in history class. As he said, crises inside of the Chinese script in Mandarin is simply the words danger and opportunity. Danger. An opportunity. And what we know is that this crisis forced a change. It forced an opportunity for us to change in healthcare. Uh, now, this change didn't come peacefully. It wasn't one that many of us went kicking and screaming. Uh, some went voluntarily, but others were forced. But we were forced to change our approach dealing with COVID. We now had to deal with ideas of trying to streamline and prioritize care for certain individuals based upon their level of illness. We had to impact virtual medicine, telephone calls and video visits to take care of patients. We had to adapt virtual rounding in the hospital, uh, uh, transform our approach completely as it relates to this. And as a result of all of these things coming out of 2020, we had to reimagine healthcare in the post-COVID state. You remember I said BC before COVID and AC is after COVID. So this AC after COVID period of time it's really requiring this transformation, this advancement. And so we see that the unrelenting impact of COVID-19 pandemic has exposed disturbing cracks in our healthcare delivery system worldwide. We see all this firsthand. In doing so, it has also catalyzed forces for, um, for new uh, ways of thinking about healthcare and for positive change that may uh, need now that many need now, right? And are vital in a post-pandemic world. We have to look at our access to the right data. We have to utilize computer and artificial intelligence to power surveillance. We have to look at virtual care to reach the vulnerable. This is what was adapted during the COVID period and have transparency and trust in the best evidence available at that moment. And this is one of the key things. And these are the tenants for the advancements in managing hypertension and hyperlipidemia. Right, this is really what we look at, and this is nothing new. We have faced crises, we face challenges. When I reflect back, I love history, and look back to the history of America and see President Roosevelt, who suffered with hypertension for many years, developing malignant hypertension, and ultimately a hypertensive emergency that ended his life in the form of a stroke. Uh, this crisis 
It triggered and reverberated throughout America, causing financial crises. But at the same point in time, that danger, it also led to opportunity. Because then what we saw as Americans, we saw this mobilization of our forces. We saw that his event in 1945 really triggered an onslaught of research that was really an, an innovation that was put into developing a cure for hypertension and developing treatments for hypertension. And as a result, we saw that medications began to kind of pour into the system here, whether or not it was from direct basal dilators uh, in the 1950s to thiazide diuretics, one of our staples. We look at uh, issues of, of uh, alpha antagonists and, and calcium channel blockers and beta blockers by Sir John Black, who developed this, ACE inhibitors and, and angiotensin receptor blockers and renin inhibitors. We started looking at the physiology and really began to apply that physiology to how we sought to treat hypertension. And as a result, what were the results of our effort? What were the fruits of our labors? This was reported in the Journal of American Medical Association. And we it said this systemic this a systematic review and, and network meta-analysis of basically 46 clinical trials involving a quarter of a million participants. What they found is that the application of therapies like ACE inhibitors, calcium channel blockers, and diuretics, it led to a reduction in overall cardiovascular events by 25%, cardiovascular death by 20%, and stroke by 35%. Phenomenal. Look at the impact that this has had in lives saved. We see that despite these therapies, here's the thing though, despite these therapies, somehow our screening has dipped. Our awareness of high blood pressure as an impact has dipped. And this is something our Surgeon General really brought out during COVID as we learned about the relationship between hypertension and the SARS-CoV virus. He brought to light that studies were revealing that our awareness of our high blood pressure decline, but also our therapy, our treatment had declined from 50, nearly 54% to 43% had declined. Uh, this was nothing new, but we saw that in general, despite the availability of this diverse treatments, this, the opportunities that were there, fewer than one in five patients were taking this opportunity to control their blood pressure. Hence the management of hypertension has become an important healthcare goal. It's not just high blood pressure, but also cholesterol, the other subject of our conversation. We look at cholesterol, this history really kind of began as there was discovery of atherosclerotic plaques that they contain cholesterol, that the high cholesterol in the diet actually started looking in animals and showing that the impact of fat from animal products played a role in the development of atherosclerosis, which is a fancy term, as we all know, that reflects the issues that pertain to stroke and heart attacks and peripheral vascular disease and impotence. And these studies began and perpetuated in the early 20th century. And what's so interesting is around 1955, around the midpoint, as we started learning about these risk factors more and more, America was once again struck with a crisis, struck with a crisis when our, our hero, our own Iron Man, our own superhero, and President Eisenhower, who had led the D-Day the attack, who had helped us in World War II come out of that, he suffered a heart attack while on vacation. This once again sent reverberations throughout the United States as the markets were frozen, as the political system was, was handcuffed in that moment. And, and, and what ended up happening as a result, as therapy was limited, we realized that there was an opportunity, that we had to respond to this crisis once again. And this is in part moving past the danger and seize the opportunity. And as a result of this, the, the evidence and the research began to just explode. We saw identification of this low density or the lousy dense lipoprotein that causes the harm, the small dense lipoprotein. The receptor was discovered and finally a cure endo uh, uh, discovered the HMG-CoA reductase for statins and began this process with lovastatin and other statins that began to develop and once again, the medications begin to explode as we begin to learn and under, as we understand the physiology and the biochemistry, we begin to apply therapeutic approaches to alter this trajectory of cholesterol uh, elevation that was shown to be associated with vascular disease. And we've seen this explosion, numerous studies that are repeated and planned in the future throughout the scope of the 20th and 21st now century. 
what's been the fruits of our labors? Well, once again, we know that as a result of the cholesterol lowering drugs and the outcomes, the Journal of American College of Cardiology reported that high quality evidence for statins revealed 25% reduction in major adverse um, cardiovascular events and reductions in fatal and non-fatal coronary heart disease and stroke events. But despite this in a similar fashion to hypertension, we still know that quite a few Americans are undertreated. Quite a few Americans are unaware of their cholesterol levels. Quite a few Americans still have elevated cholesterol values despite having therapies available to them. Uh, it tells us that we need a transformation. It, it tells us that we've identified a, a need for transformation uh, and true advancements in hypertension and hyperlipidemia. And so as we look at the focus of what these advancements have been, once again, they focus very similarly to what came during the COVID period of time, that BC and AC before COVID, after COVID. We have to transform our data the way that we collect data. And we have to transform our digital system and transformation to be able to gain access, our healthcare delivery, the biotech and biomedical and population science transformation. These are the advancements. So let's touch on these as they apply both to high blood pressure and apply to high cholesterol. When we look at the data science transformation, here's one of the things that we know. At the foundation of our recommendations are randomized controlled trials. These are the ones that have the highest level of benefit. And so what studies have shown is we know for instance, hypertension and hyperlipidemia, it has been stayed in large number of randomized controlled trials. Uh, most of today's approach to hypertension and hyperlipidemia management, especially treatment uh, guidelines, are derived from interpretation of the data from randomized controlled trials. Now, the big problem with this is that randomized controlled trials often do not take into account diversity of real life. And this is something that sprang out of 2020 is understanding that given discrimination that we need to be inclusive of gender, of ethnicity, of, of orientation inside of the research. So then that way it can apply to a diverse community. And so recent analysis of randomized controlled trials, it's revealed many current sub subgroups with important differences, yet recommended, recommended treatments and guidelines are based on the, the mean results of randomized controlled trials and expert consensus. There is a need for big data and real-time evidence. We have to transform the way in which we, we achieve data and that we apply the data. With the second step, what we were looking to as well as advancements in, in digital transformation. I've had the great fortune of working on the forefront of this within my institution and in developing a home-based cardiac rehab program in combination with Samsung technology, where we're able to um, use our, uh, artificial intelligence and the cloud to gather information from the, the patient to identify issues post-cardiac event, heart attack, stroke, heart failure in advance. This is just one avenue. There's also developments for wearable blood pressure uh, uh, devices, for home blood pressure units. But the key to all these things is for them to be uploaded to the cloud, right? And be transmitted to electronic uh, uh, medical records. And this is really where you get healthcare um, delivery transformation, because when these home devices are now FDA approved, as they are increasingly becoming, whether or not it's monitoring the heart rhythm, the blood pressure, and even the cholesterol as there's home um, lab testings kits that are available, we're now able to utilize artificial intelligence to increase our surveillance, which can increase the awareness without burdening the healthcare providers, those of you out there. Um, and so this becomes an extremely important avenue. Now, here's one area that's so interesting to me in a similar fashion to the way in which we combat it. We use technology that was already in existence to help fight the COVID virus and develop a, a vaccination using mRNA. In a very similar fashion, there's a great deal of work that's happening on RNA interference. And this is a promising strategy for hypertensive agents as well as hyperlipidemic agents. See, the RNA is its naturally occurring regulatory mechanism to silence gene expression. RNAs are short, are, um, they're short RNAs that activate ribonucleases to target homologous mRNA resulting in silencing of specific genes. This, this, this inhibitory RNA is an important tool for research to learn about the function of, of a gene, but also for therapeutic intervention to target diseases that may result from an undesirable activity of a gene. 
As for hypertension, we look at things like angiotensinogen. You know, we're looking at the pathways for HMG-CoA um, for hyperlipidemia. And these are the targets for ideas like the, uh, the inhibitory uh, RNAs. So studies are demonstrating a relationship between things like an angiotensinogen and hypertension. You can see here from the graphical representation that these have been the targets of all of our therapies over the past 50 years as we've looked at looking at various strategies to really target this. And so if we're able to take it upstream, there was, there was a, a movie called Minority Report where Tom Cruise went back in time to stop the assailant before they ever committed the crime. So the concept is, is that if we can go back in time, go back and stop it at the beginning, similar to the Terminator, right? That we can end the, uh, the cascade as long as it's proven safe. It's one phenomenal technique that's being done. The other one is that of regenerative medicine. We know hundreds of thousands, of millions of individuals are suffering with heart attacks and with strokes and subsequent heart failures and, and impacting their morbidity as well as their mortality. And so the concept of regenerative medicine says new regenerative medicine strategies include stem cell, cellular programming, tissue engineering, and this holds a promise for tissue regeneration and restoration of function after myocardial infarctions and strokes. These advancements in epigenetics, it could shed new insights into environmental factors affecting hypertension. You know, these are phenomenal, but you know, sometimes the answer is so obvious that you can't see it because you're looking too hard. It's right under your nose. And we're seeing this growing field of something called nutrigenomics and, and genomic basis for dietary responses in food is powerful. Food is powerful. And so what's so interesting is that I am a student of history. And so during the time that FDR, we spoke about him and hypertension, the crises surrounding his event that sent us into action, creating an opportunity for us to advance. During that same time, there was great work being done by a doctor, Walter Kempner. You see, during the last years of FDR's life, Dr. Kempner performed studies out of Duke University. Uh, on a novel approach to malignant hypertension, demonstrating remarkable outcomes. Uh, he fed his patients rice and vegetables alone and was able to demonstrate a reversal of malignant hypertension. Imagine for a moment if this therapy had been rendered to, to FDR. Imagine it for a moment that there was realization that the cure could have been right under their noses. In uh, a very similar reflection on history, during the same time that, that Dwight D. Eisenhower suffered his heart attack. Nathan Pritikin also was diagnosed with this thing called coronary ischemia, this lack of blood flow. And then during those periods of time, you have to recognize that times were different. You didn't go in for a stand and walk out the same day and go back to life as normal. You were now disabled. You were now told not to stress, not to walk, not to move, not to function. You were essentially dead man walking. And in a similar, uh, the similar type of scenario, uh, scenario, Nathan Pritikin said, I am going to say no to that, that he started doing his own research, even though he was a non-physician, and he realized the cure could be that inside of food, and he changed his diet, mixed with exercise, and was able to, to show, demonstrate reversal of his objective features of coronary ischemia that were available at that time. He went on to do, lay the foundation for many of the nutritional studies that have now taken place over the, the ensuing decades. And he's really emphasized the idea of let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. As we discuss the role of plant-based nutrition, we go back and we start once again as it relates to COVID. And studies are showing in six countries, not one, not two, but six countries, that plant-based diets and or pescatarian diet, which means moving away from the standard American diet, moving away from the Southern style diet. They were associated with lower odds of moderate to severe COVID-19. This meant that it relegated the SARS-CoV-2 virus to essentially that of the common cold, not having a major devastating impact. These dietary patterns may be considered for protection against severe COVID is what the authors concluded in this study. This is not the first. As we look, dive a little bit closer and we look at issues surrounding the DASH diet, we're all very familiar with the DASH diet. But how many of you were from, uh, understood that the authors of the DASH diet, they built this dietary approach based off of the increasing evidence about the power of vegetarian diets to offset blood pressure, to decrease blood pressure in the control. But the, the thought was, let's make it more palatable that people will be more willing to accept it. And so this dietary approaches to stop hypertension or DASH diet, randomized 
459 adults and with systolic blood pressures around 160 over um, up to 95 to a controlled diet, also a diet enriched with fruits and vegetables, a standard controlled diet, or combination diet that was enriched with fruits and vegetables, but also low in fat and cholesterol, which meant it was low in animal products. They kept the sodium content, the salt content the same, um, and it didn't differ. So in that way, there was not a difference based predicated on the, on the salt intake. And when they saw this, your eyes don't deceive you. What we found was we found that the diet enriched in fruits and vegetables, but also low in fat and cholesterol, which means animal products, which is the only source of fat and cholesterol, of cholesterol. We saw much remarkably lower levels of blood pressure, a decrease in systolic and diastolic pressure of, of, of nearly 5.5 and 3 millimeters in those who adhered to the, the diet that was low in fruits and vegetables and low in fat and cholesterol. But here's the thing. This study also showed that any movement by the addition, you get subtraction. By addition of fruits and vegetables, even to the standard diet, that you still had a decline in the blood pressure. So there's power to get moving. This was also kind of reiterated in another study uh, reported on New England Journal of Medicine that looked at a similar type scenario here, reflecting on the issues here and showing once again that these things were powerful is what we saw here. Another study out of Journal of American uh, Medical Association, Journal of Medicine, it demonstrated that consumption of vegetarian diets was associated with a reduction in mean systolic blood pressure of nearly five millimeters of mercury and diastolic of two millimeters of mercury compared with consumption of omnivorous uh, diets. Uh, 32 observational studies um, looking at nearly 22,000 participants, it showed nearly a drop in systolic blood pressure by seven millimeters of mercury on average and diastolic of five, which means many had a lot more, some had a little bit less and compared to the consumption of omnivorous diets. It led authors to conclude that consumption of vegetarian diets is associated with the lower blood pressure, um, and such diets could be useful non-pharmacologic means for reducing blood pressure. In another study, this compared vegan diets to lacto-ovo vegetarian diets, which means eggs and milk were still allowed. And it seemed to offer additional, that vegan diets offered a, additional benefit for protection, not only for high blood pressure, but also diabetes and obesity and cardiovascular mortality. What we find is we find that nutrition it impacts not just one disease, but many diseases. And, and as we move on, we look at fruits. Studies are increasingly coming out on a weekly, monthly basis, it seems like, that people who consumed a diet rich in flavanol, rich foods um, and drinks, including apple, tea, berries, it could lead to lower blood pressure, according to the first study using objective measures of thousands in the UK residents' diet. The British Journal of Nutrition um, also concluded from another study that fruits and vegetables were the food groups of the DASH diet associated with reduced blood uh, values in patients with type two diabetes and consumption might play a role in uh, against increased blood pressure values. Another study of uh, current opinions in cardiology basically looked at uh, and reflected on the fact that adopting a diet rich in plant-based uh, whole grains, low fat dairy products and, and sodium intake within normal limits, similar to DASH diet, it can be effective in the prevention and management of hypertension. That these diets have been found to be more effective in older adults, which means your age is, does not depend. Just because you're older doesn't mean it's too late to change, that you can still impact the outcomes. As we know, many of our, our morbidity and mortality events occur in older individuals. These things both accentuate the Loma Linda Health Study, the Evans Health Study, which showed that as you begin this process of moving from eating standard American diet, towards a whole food plant-based diet, rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, legumes, nuts, and seeds, we see that the blood pressure declines irrespective of one's race or ethnicity. Similar features were shown with cholesterol. And study from the Journal of American uh, Health, uh, Heart Association is shown in a systematic review and analysis. It provides evidence that vegetarian diets are effective in lowering blood concentrations of total cholesterol, LDL, um, HDL as well and that such diets could be a useful non-pharmacologic means of managing dyslipidemia, especially hyperlipidemia. Wonderful study that was done, uh, published in Lancet in 1990 by Dean Ornish. He randomized individuals over to a vegetarian low-fat diet 
but also say, hey, you got to quit smoking. You need to move. You need to work on your stress. And as a result of this, he showed a reduction in, in the cholesterol values that were significant in your uh, LDL, but also a, uh, a reduction in the HDL. In general, what they demonstrate is that cholesterol decreased by 24%, LDL decreased by 37%, and weight overall decreased by 22% by focusing on lifestyle. These studies were again accentuated by the portfolio study, a very unique and well-performed study that randomized 46 healthy, uh, high cholesterol individuals to, um, to one of three interventions in over, uh, for one month, a low-fat diet, a low-fat diet plus lovastatin, or actually choosing to focus on what they added to their diet, almonds and plant sterols, soy protein, viscous fibers, aggressive plant-based nutrition, and essentially your eyes don't deceive you. In comparison to the low-fat diet alone versus the low-fat diet plus the statin, what the study revealed is that by the addition of these plant sterols, by addition of aggressive whole food plant-based nutrition, they were able to lower the level of cholesterol, bad cholesterol, as well as your C-reactive inflammatory protein in a comparable level to that used with the statin drugs. These are all reflective of the data that shows out of the Adventist Health Study, one of the largest studies similar to Framingham study that, that is looking at nutrition based out of Mobile Linda, California. And this study once again showed that as we move from eating standard American diet, which is rich in, in refined products, rich in animal products, um, to as well rich in dairy and fat, that as you move away from that towards a whole food plant-based diet, that irrespective of race and ethnicity, we're able to decrease the status of, of high cholesterol and decrease that burden. There's a wonderful quote by Anne Wigmore, and she says that the food you eat cannot, can be either the safest and most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. I want to, I want to propose to you today, ABC and, and uh, MBNA, that, that um, what's old is new and what's new is old. Uh, I want to tell you that, that, that the idea of nutrition as our therapy, nutrition as our medicine is not a new concept and that's becoming, a, but it is becoming new in its applications. And we're finding more and more and more that as we look at innovative strategies to incorporate lifestyle, that there is a secret sauce in really decreasing this thing called disparities in America as a whole, but also inside of subsets of America, like the African-American community, the indigenous community, the Latino community, and decreasing the burden of disease. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time and, and attention as we have reviewed the advancements and the management of hypertension and hyperlipidemia. I am certainly open to questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Batiste. Last but not least is Dr. Sabra C. Lucy. She's Assistant Professor of Medicine at the Division of Cardiology at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Dr. Lucy is an advanced heart failure and transplant cardiologist. She will be discussing pharmacological advancements in managing heart failure. Dr. Lucy. Good day, congratulations to the MBNA and to the ABC for another successful program. And thank you to Dr. Ferdinand for the invitation to present. I'll be discussing new advances in pharmacologic management of heart failure. It wasn't too long ago where we considered the mainstays of heart failure therapy to be diuretics and digoxin and then the emergence of ACE inhibition and beta blockade. But really in the last seven years, there has been a bit of renaissance in the field of heart failure and several new therapies have emerged for management. I have no disclosures with relation to this activity. To frame our conversation, I thought it best to start with a, a case of a dear patient of mine um, that presented to my clinic. He's a 49 year old gentleman. He actually self-referred and found our practice um, uh, by going online to the ABC. He has longstanding type 2 diabetes since about 30 years of age. He did his best to control this with diet and exercise, but eventually ended up on oral medications. He unfortunately suffered his first heart attack at the age of 38, uh, leading to an urgent need for a stent. And then from that point on, he was in the care of a cardiologist. In subsequent years, he had recurrent bouts of heart failure, got a stress test, got another stent, then again, chest pain. Um, uh, uh, requiring another uh, take back to the cath lab to get another stent. His heart pump function gradually declined from there. 
um, and he had asymptomatic systolic dysfunction for a period of time, was started on medications with an initial improvement uh, in his ejection fraction, but then his ejection fraction then dropped again to uh, be in, in the mid 20s. Um, and his medications were not changed at that time. Uh, about two years later, after developing heart failure, he had a stroke and thankfully rehabilitated from his deficits. With regards to his symptomatic heart failure progression, the course started two years prior to coming to see me. He had these recurrent urgent care visits for heart failure where he went in for shortness of breath. And then six months prior to seeing me had uh, a, a classic presentation of congestion with the hallmark symptoms of dyspnea and exertion, proxismal nocturnal dyspnea, orthopnea, and peripheral edema. Um, and he had noticed really a significant change in his symptomatology over the last year. He was getting symptoms of minimal exertion. And um, he, he was winded just coming in from his car to the clinic. His kids were helping him to put on his shoes because he was getting winded just bending over. His exam, when I saw him that day, corroborated his history. He was hypertensive to 135 over 82. He had elevated neck veins. He had signs of right and left-sided cardiac volume overload. Um, in terms of his uh, medication regimen, he was on ACE inhibition with benazepril, beta blockade with carvedilol, diuretics, blood thinners, and then diabetes medications. His laboratory studies showed that he had some chronic renal uh, disease with a creatinine of 1.4, but his, the rest of his electrolytes were, were, were pretty much in normal limits and he had an elevated blood sugar. His EKG was notable for the absence of cardiac pacing on a narrow QRS complex. So we may be all asking ourselves after this uh, story, what is the next step in management? And, and yes, that is an important next question. But what I hope to leave with you today is it's not just what is the next step in management, but more importantly, what is at stake with the next step in management and how we have to be very intentional in the management of patients with heart failure to improve outcomes and save lives. We know that heart failure remains a worldwide killer and disabler. Uh, cohort studies from the 90s have shown us that suggested one year survival, um, regardless of ejection fraction, is just shy of 80%, and that estimated 50% of heart failure patients um, meet their demise within five years of diagnosis. The story is a little bit different for African Americans, and recent data has shown us that uh, this is a troubling disparity gap that continues to widen. So this was a research letter published two years ago that uh, looked at data from the Centers for Disease Control wide-ranging online data for epidemiologic research, showing that premature deaths in young and middle-aged African-Americans between the ages of 35 and 64 are actually increasing over the last 18 years. These are heart failure-related cardiovascular deaths. Um, we are seeing that it's also increasing in the older age group, but not at the same rate that is increasing in younger African-Americans. So we know that the uh, mortality disparity gap is widening in African Americans. In order to frame our conversation about new therapies, I, I always think it's helpful to start with the schematic about the stages of heart failure. And why do I think this is helpful? Well, one, it reminds us as treating providers that um, heart failure is progressive. This arrow that we see going from stage A to B to C to D shows a unilateral one direction. And so we know that once an individual is stage C, um, they're not able to go back to stage B or stage A. They, they are in a new stage of, of the heart failure process. And it also reminds us on, on the schematic that stage A, stage B, there are opportunities along this pathway for intervention to prevent progression of heart failure. As we're talking about new therapies, it's also important to talk about the new universal classification system that was um, uh, uh, published this year in which we now are able to classify heart failure by ejection fraction. This was essentially done in practice by saying an ejection fraction above 50% or an ejection fraction below 50%. But now we have termed it that heart failure with reduced ejection fraction means an EF less than 40% mildly reduced EF or what was previously called mid-range EF is between 40 and 50% and heart failure preserved, preserved ejection fraction are those individuals with heart failure above 50%. One thing that I really like about this universal classification is that it 
highlights the importance of understanding the unique group of heart failure with improved EF, and that those are individuals who had reduced ejection fraction and have improved over time and how we need to consider them and their therapies. So what is our heart failure pharmacologic armamentarium? Well, these classes of medications comprise that armamentarium consisting of renin angiotensin aldosterone antagonists, beta blockers, mineral corticoid receptor or aldosterone antagonists, hydralazine and nitrates, funny channel inhibitors, sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors, and soluble guanylate cyclase stimulators. We're gonna be focusing mostly on heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and the ARNI complex and SGLT2 inhibition. On this slide, the asterisks indicate medications that are already in the um, uh, guidelines for management of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Um, though I will not be talking about cardiac specific myosin activators, I'm happy to take questions about those in the discussion. I think this slide is very helpful that I won't, but I won't spend a ton of time on it, but it does illustrate from this meta-analysis, the um, a comprehensive compilation of high impact trials that really have formed the foundation for modern day heart failure therapy in which we see from the early 1990s to the mid uh, uh, 2000s, where we have ACE inhibition then building on that with beta blockade, then building on that with mineral corticoid receptor antagonists and angiotensin receptor blockers to get us to our current day. And why does this matter? Well, we know that um, combination of heart failure therapy across the classes is more beneficial if we look at um, benefit in terms of all cause mortality combining of the classes is more beneficial than single or dual class therapy or single therapy versus placebo alone. And so the evolution of guideline directed medical therapy is just as important a part of this conversation as any one class of medication. So let's take a closer look at the new kids on the block. So this is a simplified schematic of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And we, we already know that stress signals induce the angiotensin gene and that gives us this pro-hormone angiotensinogen, which is then cleaved by renin and angiotensin one and to biologically active angiotensin two. Um, and that angiotensin uh, uh, can be a uh, alternatively cleaved by nephrolysin to give us these pro-hormones, making the angiotensin II uh, biologically active to then interact with the angiotensin I receptor and cause deleterious downstream effects, vasoconstriction, oxidative stress, um, pathologic changes in terms of hypertrophy and fibrosis. However, if we're able to intervene and block the uh, nephrolysin, inhibit nephrolysin, we can stop the breakdown of favorable neurohormones or natriuretic peptides that have um, uh, beneficial effects in the cardiac myocyte. So this led to the landmark Paradigm HF trial, a landmark trial in heart failure published in 2014 in the New England Journal of Medicine. This was 8,000 patients with symptomatic heart failure who were randomized um, to Sucubitril Valsartan versus Enalapril, they had all reduced ejection fraction with an EF less than 40%. The primary endpoint in this trial was death from a cardiovascular um, cause or heart failure hospitalization. The target dose that was um, uh, 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 reached for in this trial for um, Sucubitril Valsartan was 200 milligrams twice daily versus Enalapril, which was 10 milligrams twice daily. This trial was stopped early at median follow-up of 27 months, given benefit from the ARNI complex over an alloperal therapy. The absolute risk reduction was 4.7% with a number needed to treat of 21 patients. So as compared with an analopro, we know that Sucubitril Valsartan reduced risk of hospitalizations from heart failure, decreased symptoms of physical um, limitation, and met its primary endpoint. The major adverse side effects in the subcubitral valsartan arm was that there was more um, uh, uh, proportion of hypotension and more non-serious angioedema. Um, uh, renal impacts, hyperkalemia were actually uh, higher in the enalapril arm of the trial. And it's important to note that individuals before they were randomized to subcubitral valsartan in this trial 
um, actually had to tolerate an enalapril run-in phase and then were um, transitioned over to this Kuchil Valsartan. And so that, that is a, an important reason why that has evolved in the guidelines. So this was published in 2014 and so Kuchil Valsartan was FDA approved in 2014. And this was the landmark trial um, allowing it to have class one level recommendation in modern day heart failure therapy. So Paradigm HF really uh, in, encompassed the individuals who had class two and three heart failure. There are very few individuals who had advanced cardiomyopathy. What do I mean by advanced heart cardiomyopathy? I mean, individuals with New York Heart Association class four heart failure, um, injection fraction less than 35%, who have um, been on guideline-directed medical therapy, but have had to have some peel back in that guideline-directed medical therapy, which is a characteristic of end-stage heart failure because they're no longer able to tolerate it have had previously been on inotropes, had had heart failure hospitalizations indicating that they were advanced or had some objective evidence of um, uh, severe exercise intolerance by cardiopulmonary exercise testing or poor performance on a six minute walk indicating that they were advanced. And these were the inclusion criteria used in the LIFE trial, which was a trial looking at 335 patients across centers um, uh, randomizing between Sucubitril Valsartan and Valsartan in advanced cardiomyopathy patients. This trial unfortunately had to end early because of concerns about adverse outcomes on patients um, given the COVID-19 epidemic. And it did not meet its primary endpoint, which was looking at a change, a proportional change in the NT pro BNP. And the trial did not meet its secondary tertiary endpoints, looking at days alive out of the hospital, freedom for heart failure events, or cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization. That being said, um, there were uh, many reasons and questions that still remain as to why um, these were the outcomes of this particular trial. I would say in my practice, if I have a patient who I have evidence that they have advanced cardiomyopathy, but I think they have blood pressure room or other indications that they would be able to tolerate sucubitril valsartan therapy, I do give it a try until um, I have an indication that they would not be able to tolerate it. Um, as expected, the um, primary thing that limited achievement of target dosing in this trial for advanced cardiomyopathy patients was hypotension. So what about Sucubitril Valsartan, the Arnie complex in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? Well, this was addressed in the Paragon HF trial. This was a trial of just under 5,000 patients with stable hef hef randomized to Sucubitril Valsartan at target doses of 97 over 103 twice daily versus Valsartan at 160 milligrams twice daily. They were followed by thir for 35 months. Um, these individuals were symptomatic. The ejection fractions were greater than 45%. And they ruled in for the diagnosis of HEFPEF, which could be a, a lecture in and of itself of what is HEFPEF. But they ruled in for the diagnosis of HEFPEF by um, elevation in natriuretic peptides and structural changes as evidenced by left atrial enlargement or left ventricular hypertrophy. This trial did not meet its primary endpoint, which was a composite endpoint of total hospitalizations for heart failure and death from cardiovascular causes, as we can see that confidence interval crosses one. But there was some important takeaways from this trial. One of those takeaways was in a sub-analysis looking at um, stratification by median EF in the trial. And they could see that individuals who had that ejection fraction that was on the lower side, even though they were classified as heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, they were on the lower end of that spectrum. There was more benefit from the ARNI complex in comparison to those who had the higher ejection fractions. Um, this was this sub-analysis was discussed by the FDA committee um, reviewing this medication and in late 2020. And uh, Sucubitril Valsartan was then approved earlier this year by the FDA for indication of use in um, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, or really for individuals who have that ejection fraction just below 50% at mid range EF category. So, what are the indications for use of the angiotensin receptor nephrolysin inhibitor complex? So, as we've discussed, um, it is 
guideline directed medical therapy with a class one level of recommendation to use the ARNI complex in individuals with heart failure and an ejection fraction less than 40%. It has also been FDA approved for individuals with an EF less than 50% and symptomatic heart failure. Um, in the guidelines, you will see that even individuals with asymptomatic heart failure can be considered um, uh, for ARNI complex use, but certainly symptomatic heart failure, ARNI complex is preferred. Um, it should be administered in conjunction with uh, background guideline directed medical therapy, meaning with beta blockade, with mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, and it is to replace inhibition or angiotensin receptor blockers. They are not to be used concomitantly. With that being said, if someone was on an ACE inhibitor, as was done with the Paradigm HF trial, there needs to be a 36-hour washout to um, prevent a exaggerated effect of hypotension um, uh, uh, to wash out that ACE inhibitor before the ARNI complex is initiated and patients need to be very clearly counseled on how to do this. If your patient has had a history of angioedema, um, then the ARNI complex should be avoided in that class of patients. What you should do is um, follow their blood pressures after initiation and um, follow labs for impact on renal function and electrolytes as, as we standardly do in patients with heart failure. And um, it's also helpful to remember um, uh, the impact on cardiac biomarkers. So as we're affecting the um, natriuretic peptides by blocking the degradation of nephrolysis inhibitors, this can infect the BMP um, that we may get that we follow for evidence of heart failure decompensation. It's helpful to remember that the NT pro BMP will actually be reduced um, after initiation of army therapy. So we're gonna transition now to talk about the sodium glucose co-transporter two inhibitors. So this has just been a really exciting time to watch the evolution of this therapy. Um, SGLT2 inhibitors came about from large diabetes trials that were required to um, report on cardiovascular implications of the medication given historical, con historical context of what we've learned from previous diabetes medications and impact on cardiovascular disease. And so that is how these have come to be. Um, SGLT2 inhibitors, um, act by impacting the proximal convoluted tubule to block reabsorption of sugar or glucose back into the system. And that um, ultimately uh, allows for sugar to be excreted, glucose to be excreted um, in the urine that causes a glucosuria and a naturesis. And um, by having this flow out in the urine, um, that provides reduction in total plasma volume in the body improves vascular resistance, and that may have benefit in reducing blood pressure, may have um, benefit in changing the way, excuse me, tissue handles sodium, um, and, and, and that has some beneficial impacts in terms of heart failure management. When we think about actual cardiac effects of SGLT2 inhibitors, so this is a really exciting area with a lot of emerging evidence, um, we know that there is this naturesis and diuresis effect that I've talked about that changes ventricular loading. So it can reduce preload, may change afterload, impacting blood pressure. But there may be a direct cardiac effect in terms of changing or altering uh, myocardial energetics and metabolomics. And so this is a very um, uh, interesting and budding area of research. When we consider the evolution of these trials, um, really the last uh, six or seven years um, have, have been a, a crescendo effect for the SGLT2 inhibitor, starting with the infrared trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2015. That was 7,000 patients uh, with diabetes who were at high risk for cardiovascular disease, um, and they were randomized to placebo versus empagliflozin the primary outcome of cardiovascular death or non-fetal MI. And they uh, did see a benefit in terms of um, a reduction in, in heart failure hospitalizations. Um, and so that uh, was the precipice that led to the following trials in terms of seeing a benefit in heart failure prevention. And then actual heart failure treatment trials with SGLT2 inhibitors were recently published. And these are the three that we'll focus on, DAPA-HF, 
solo SWHF and Emperor reduced. Um, it is important to also note that we have on the horizon um, trials that um, we're all very excited to see the outcomes of in terms of SGLT2 inhibitor impacts on heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So the DAPA-HF trial um, was a trial at uh, many centers um, across several countries, randomizing 4,700 or so patients with symptomatic heart failure, um, class two and three heart failure, the uh, majority of folks in this trial, an ejection fraction less than 40% to 10 milligrams of dipagliflozin versus placebo. These individuals were on high um, doses of background uh, guideline-directed medical therapy, high rates of beta blocker use and RAS antagonism, in addition to a high rate of MRI, MRA use, which is very important to note. Primary endpoint in this trial was worsening of uh, heart failure, so heart failure hospitalization um, or cardiovascular death. And this trial did meet its primary endpoint and showed a benefit in cardiovascular and all-cause mortality with uh, dipagliflozin use. So the absolute risk reduction was 4.9%. You can see the divergence in the Captain Meyer curves. And this was um, a beneficial impact regardless of diabetes status. So individuals with or without diabetes had benefit from dipagliflozin in this trial. Solus WHF um, was a trial looking at citagliflozin. Citagliflozin is a com combination inhibitor. So it inhibits SGLT2, which has the impact on the kidney and the proximal convoluted tubule, but also has an impact on SGLT1 inhibition in the gut. And that impacts postprandial glucose reabsorption, delays that intestinal glucose reabsorption. So this was a trial of 1,200 patients, randomized about 600 in each group to citagliflozin versus placebo. And uh, the thing to note here is that these are individuals with acute heart failure. So heart failure hospitalization um, or recent discharge from heart failure hospitalization randomized to citagliflozin. And this trial had its um, composite endpoint um, uh, being um, a, a uh, death or heart failure hospitalization, and it did meet its primary endpoint, uh, showing benefit, but also showing safety and use in acute heart failure. Number needed to treat here was four. And the thing that I will um, uh, leave you with is if we look at the first occurrence of either death um, or hospitalization, we see early separation in these curves showing us that in the first two to four weeks of treatment with citagliflozin, there is an impact on actual meaningful clinical outcomes for patients. So early initiation of citagliflozin had benefit in this trial. In this subgroup analysis highlighted on the bottom of the slide, we can see that they also stratified by ejection fraction to look at those with an ejection fraction greater than 50% uh, or who would qualify as hef -pef. And they saw a signal for benefit there in that um, citagliflozin arm, though it wasn't powered for that, um, there was at least a hint of benefit of he in HEFPEF for an SGLT2 primary medication. And um, the last trial in the SGLT2 heart flow treatments that I will just uh, discuss briefly, it was emperor reduced, looking at empagliflozin in individuals with um, recent volume overload versus without recent volume overload. Um, this was uh, a trial that randomized to empagliflozin 10 milligrams versus placebo, about 2,000 individuals in each arm of the trial. And um, this also is looking at a composite uh, endpoint of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization. And this uh, outcome is really driven by benefit and heart, heart failure hospitalization reduction. But also this trial showed regardless of diabetes status, that empagliflozin had this benefit and also had um, benefit in terms of improving health status and renal outcomes, which was also very helpful to note. So when we consider SGLT2 inhibitors, they are right now for individuals with an EF less than 40% with or without diabetes, but there's emerging evidence about um, higher ejection fractions if it be indicated there. Symptomatic heart failure, consider patients with early initiation, because you'll see that impact early on after starting the therapy. It should be used in conjunction with um, high degrees of background guideline-directed medical therapy, meaning all the other classes. 
One to avoid SGLT2 inhibitors would be in the setting of type 1 diabetes. Um, currently, in individuals who are on dialysis or lactating or certainly have any type of hypersensitivity to the drug, um, right now there's caution to be used with, with the GFR less than 30, but we're learning more about the renal protective effects of SGLT2 inhibitors. And early on in these trials, there was um, uh, the adverse event of genitourinary uh, infections. And I, I think that is something that um, hasn't uh, been as much of a concern more recently, but certainly um, something that we need to counsel our patients on uh, signs to, to look for to alert us early. So if I leave you with nothing else during this talk, I will uh, leave you with this, that in the modern era, Guideline-directed medical therapy for heart failure is quad-based therapy comprised of uh, the ARNI complex, the evidence-based beta blockers, carvedilol, metoprolol succinate, bisoprolol, a plerinone and spironolactone is the MRAs, and the current heart failure approved SGLT2 inhibitors, dipagliflozin and impagliflozin. This is a schematic that's adapted from Dr. Fonero. And why does this matter? Well, this matters because when patients are on quad-based therapy for heart failure, they have a relative risk reduction of 73% for um, uh, adverse clinical outcomes, an absolute risk reduction of 26%, and a number needed to treat of less than four. So you can directly impact likelihood of mortality or heart failure hospitalization by getting patients on quad-based therapy. This is why this matters so much and we have to do everything possible to overcome therapeutic inertia. Um, as a point of reference, it's always helpful to go to the 2017 guidelines where you can be walked through the steps in considering heart failure um, uh, symptoms and what guideline directed medical therapy to institute at one point, certainly um, uh, ACE inhibition, beta blockers, angiotensin receptor blockers, and then converting over to an ARNI complex, uh, considering the MRAs, hydralazine and nitrates, device-based therapies, and then more advanced heart failure therapies. As we talk about new things, our practice um, guidelines were updated by expert consensus this year, certainly to um, indicate that ARNIs are preferred in stage C heart failure treatment and to add the addition of the SGLT2 inhibitors so that there's no delay in consideration of getting these therapies to patients. So back to my beloved patient, um, he came to me on benazapril and carvedilol, an ACE inhibitor and beta blocker at max doses still hypertensive with class three symptoms, recent heart failure or hospitalizations or urgent care visits, just as important, signs of congestion, history of diabetes and secondary um, uh, outcomes with CAD and stroke, renal function that showed chronic kidney disease, but a creatinine less than two, a potassium less than five and no ICD. Makes you think. So what did I do? I didn't wait. On the day that I met him, hi, sir, how are you? We initiated angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibition after instructing him on how to do the 36 hour washout, wrote a prescription for a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist and started him on an SGLT2 inhibitor. Um, I felt comfortable with the labs that his potassium was less than five and his renal function was in a place that we could start the mineral corticoid receptor antagonist and start the SGLT2 inhibitor, counseling him on how to reduce his um, background hypoglycemic agents, sent a message to his endocrinologist, and, and also sent him for follow-up labs within seven to 10 days to know the direct impact of starting these three therapies simultaneously. But there was no need to wait. In the last few minutes, I'm just going to discuss briefly these additional therapies for consideration, hydralazine and nitrates, ivabradine and varisiglac. Hydralazine and isosorbide in fixed doses has a class one recommendation in African-American patients. This is based on compelling evidence from the AHEF trial from 2004, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, where 1,000 or so self-identified African-American patients with symptomatic heart failure, predominantly class three heart failure, um, were uh, randomized to fixed dose hydralazine isosorbide versus uh, placebo with background therapy 
um, of being on beta blockade and ACE inhibition at that time. And this trial was actually stopped early given the high mortality in the placebo arm of the trial. Um, the number needed to treat here was 25 with an absolute risk reduction of 4%. It met its primary composite outcome. Um, and so in patients who have symptomatic heart failure, self-identified African-Americans already on background therapy with renin angiotensin aldosterone system antagonist and beta blockade, still symptomatic, please consider adding hydralazine isosorbide um, if, if, if indicated. Ivabridine, the funny channel uh, uh, inhibitor or selective sinus node inhibitor acts to reduce heart rate. This medication based on data from the SHIFT trial in 2010 now has a class two recommendation and a particular subset of patients. So these are patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction who are on maximally tolerated doses of evidence-based beta blockers who remain in sinus rhythm with a heart rate greater than 70 at rest. Not for people in atrial fibrillation, not for people in atrial flutter with a high heart rate, but sinus rhythm at rest, ivabridine can be considered um, to reduce that heart rate given its um, uh, benefit um, that was seen in the SHIFT trial. Ferrisiglot is probably the newest uh, kid on the block. This is a soluble guanylate cyclase stimulator that we um, are familiar with from pulmonary hypertension, um, but has had a um, recent body of evidence emerge in treatment of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. This trial was published last year uh, with 5,000 patients with chronic systolic heart failure, uh, class two to four, ejection fraction of less than 45%, were randomized to varisiguat at a target dose of 10 milligrams versus placebo. In addition to background medical therapy, we can see here um, that the primary outcome was a composite death from cardiovascular causes or first hospitalization from heart failure. And um, Verisiglot did meet uh, its primary endpoint in this trial with an absolute risk reduction of around 3% number needed to treat of 34. And so it's something if patients are on um, standard therapy that can be considered but has not made it into guidelines yet um, or our expert consensus pathway yet, this medication was improved for this indication earlier this year. So why was our patient without optimal guideline-directed medical therapy for so long? I think this is really the question that um, we have to answer now for our patients. As a cardiovascular community, we have to tackle this, this question full on. What were the barriers to access? Certainly there was therapeutic inertia. And I will say that this patient actually went to multiple providers asking to be started on the ARNI complex because of his own research that he had done for, with the medication, but there was just a um, inertia to getting this therapy started for him. There is perceived um, uh, barriers in terms of out-of-pocket costs, and then there are actual barriers in terms of out-of-pocket costs. These medications can be expensive when not covered by insurance. Um, and so that is something that needs to be systematically addressed, but also in the case of individual patients to look through every avenue in terms of patient assistance copay cards um, and, and seeing if that patient can qualify for some other coverage. We know that in um, our medical system, there is implicit bias and systemic racism. There's a large body of evidence showing that and that, that um, has impacted uh, outcomes and, and care in terms of patients with cardiovascular disease and heart failure. And there can be conflicting provider incentives that we have to address. The, the one thing that I just I can't get over with this case from this patient is how many cardiac tests and cardiac procedures uh, my patient had without being put on optimal guideline directed medical therapy first. Um, so that is something that we have to deal with head on. Don't forget, in addition to pharmacologic therapy, that there is a um, pathway to escalate therapy for advancing heart failure. Um, before I even say that, though, there is a class one recommendation in our guidelines for consideration of patients with heart failure on stable medications to be referred to cardiac rehabilitation for this cause. And it, it 
it is something that is truly beneficial and should be um, considered in patients. Um, individuals who have not recovered their ejection fraction, their EF remains reduced on guideline directed medical therapy, especially with a history of ischemic disease, should be considered for a defibrillator. And then individuals with progressive symptoms who qualify based on um, their EKG, QRS complex, or dyssynchrony of the LV should be considered for cardiac resynchronization therapy. We have had a um, large body of evidence that's uh, showing us that um, there's beneficial impact for consideration of more advanced therapies. For example, percutaneous mitral valve repair in individuals with um, functional mitral regurgitation on guideline directed medical therapy can be helpful in terms of reducing symptoms, left ventricular assist devices in terms of a mortality benefit, and then um, uh, certainly consideration of heart transplantation as in, in individuals with um, uh, advanced cardiomyopathy that is refractory to all therapies as a class one level of um, uh, evidence to consider. So this is just Dr. Lucy's two cents that I will leave you with. And it's simply that knowledge is power and we all have the power to advocate. Guideline directed medical therapy unequivocally improves survival, quality of life, and time out of the hospital, that's time with loved ones, time with children, time with siblings, so important. Guideline-directed medical therapy in this modern day is quad-based heart failure therapy. That is the four pillars utilizing renin angiotensin aldosterone antagonism, beta blockade, mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, and SGLT2 inhibitors. And it should be considered at every stage of the clinical pathway, whether the patient is outpatient, inpatient, at time of discharge, do everything possible to overcome therapeutic inertia. And really truly understand what the intolerance or contraindication is and document it and, and see if it can be reassessed. And I will say that there are multiple avenues to pursue. If there is a possibility to get change in coverage, co-pick cards, prior authorization, it's helpful in heart failure groups to have a team, a staff, that can address these issues head on. It makes a world of difference for patients. And with that, I will say thank you and I am happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you so much. Um, I must say that that was a wonderful wide ranging discussion of heart failure and all of our presenters have given us the latest data and their own personal perspectives we do have questions, they're located in the Q&A, and it's gonna be somewhat random when I ask a question, anyone can answer, but I'll try to direct it to a particular person. Uh, let's go to uh, Chloe, and I'll call you all by the first name because I don't know you personally, and in fact, I'm so pleased to know and have worked with all of you. Uh, Chloe, you, you mentioned that multiple medications were actually contraindicated in pregnancy, but we do know, especially in African-American women, there are high rates of pregnancy-related blood pressure elevation. What medications can they use safely? There are medications that can be used safely, such as the central alpha agonist methodopa and the beta blocker labetalol. Also, the calcium channel blocker nifedipine can be used. The diuretics can be used, but caution should be used when prescribing these medications for pregnant individuals. Very good. And, um, I will also say I work with Chloe, so I'm going to ask a question I know the answer to, but let's see what, what the audience will think of our answer. How do you monitor patients? You, you mentioned out-of-office blood pressure. How do you know what's going on out-of-office? Well, here at Tulane, we use an app called Sfigmo. It requires the healthcare provider to set up an account with them, which can be done at sfigmobp.com. And the patient downloads the app, and they can log in their blood pressures um, into the app. If they have a Bluetooth device, their blood pressure measurements can be uploaded automatically, which is very convenient for the patient. Then the provider goes into the Sfigmo account, selects the patient, and can easily do a swiping average of blood pressures. So it's very convenient for both the patient and the provider. Very good. All right, let me go back to order. We're gonna start with the great Carol Watson. Carol, you said statins, 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 and I followed up with LP little a. The dirty little secret is statins lower LP little a, and I believe that statin should be the first line, by the way. 
But what about the fact that statins don't lower LPA? Statins don't lower LP little a. They actually, in many cases, will raise them a little bit. But despite that, all of the evidence shows that statins reduce risk. So what we have to do is separate the number from the risk. And we know that statins will lower the risk, bar none, in all cases. So, so you, don't back off, you don't back off at all from your statins and persons with elevated LPA? I, I, I double down on my statins in people with LP little a elevation. Very good. Uh, Dr. Rachel Graham is not here, but uh, Carol, you can ans answer this question, I'm sure. We talk about the uh, branded omega-3 fatty acid products. Is there anything over the counter that you recommend? You don't have to give a brand name, but just in yeah. general, do you ever recommend over the counter omega-3s? No. So again, um, the over-the-counter omega-3s are not FDA regulated and very variable in quality and content. Almost all of them are not more than 30 or 50% long chain omega-3, which are the effective omega-3s. And everything else is filler. The usual filler is corn oil and giving a bunch of corn oil to patients is probably not a good idea. Um, so we don't recommend over-the-counter omega-3s. And Preston Mason, one of my colleagues at Harvard has shown that many of them are contaminated with saturated fats and other very not good things. So we recommend, um, if we're going to use it pharmacologically, we recommend the, the prescription. Kevin, since I've worked with you for decades, I know that uh, you're interested in patients getting access to medications not only prescribed, but let me ask you that same question. And if your answer is a little different, we're, we're all okay with that. Do you ever recommend over-the-counter omega-3? The only time I would even consider trying to get to uh, over-the-counter omega-3 uh, would be in the case of um, a patient not having insurance that would be able to cover it or just affordability. I agree with Carol completely. I had a colleague at the University of Florida, as a matter of fact, that would actually go and sweep medications uh, off of the, the, the shelves and go back and do analytical analysis of them uh, in his laboratory. And more often than not found that most over-the-counter remedies that people get rarely had either the quantity or they often had the other things inside of them, even with some of the, uh, the more reputable uh, companies. Now, having said that, um, you know, you know, we, you know, if we, if we, I don't want to mention any any of the larger chains, but um, you know, more often than not, you know, if, if if we really want them to have it, we'll just refer them to one of the large chains, uh, large chain uh, pharmacies. But having said that, I'm I'm become a big fan of uh, chia seeds, um, and I think uh, Dr. Patiz would, would probably really enjoy hearing that. And trying to do more natural means of trying to uh, trying to have dietary means of getting it, but over the counter, uh, very often it's going to be hit or miss. Uh, exactly how Dr. Watson said. All right, Columbus, you mentioned your name. Uh, diet, exercise, lifestyle, but you can make the case that these are very difficult. They should be recommended, and uh, we heard about the benefits of cardiac rehabilitation clearly has been demonstrated. But let's say outside of cardiac rehab, and Sarah, you can comment on this also. How do you get patients to make these changes, Columbus? You know, it's, it's always a challenge. And I think first it's recognizing who they are and, and appreciating their culture. That's one of the key things. It's, imp it's impossible to try and fit someone into your paradigm, but you have to first say, recognize their you recognize their culture, and if they're African American, then really touching on the benefits of plant-rich sources, which go back throughout the eons of time and are ingrained into the cooking. And so when you highlight that and you recognize that, hey, listen, okra actually has benefits to you, that, hey, you're using a lot of these things inside your normal cooking pattern, we're going to focus on those more than adding in some of the things that have been shown to be harmful. We're not saying don't, we're saying do. And as you begin that process and they see the changes, I've seen an adoption of, of a transition towards it. A brief example, a patient I just saw yesterday who had severe coronary artery disease, bypass surgery, and I hadn't seen her in several years. And she, she, sent, uh, she messaged me and she said, hey doc, listen, I wanna let you know 
that I finally have been, I'm not completely plant-based, but I have increased my foods astronomically and her numbers have improved tremendously. And that's the power of recognizing culture. All right, Sabra, I know that uh, diet, lifestyle, exercise are very important for patients with heart failure. How do you approach those barriers? So I start up front in my first uh, encounter with my patients to say, this is where we're trying to get to. I understand what you've been through. I understand, you know, you have some concerns, but this is where we're trying to reach. This is our goal. And it's going to take us changing every aspect of how you go about things. Yes, diet. Yes, exercise. And I tell them why it's beneficial in heart failure. And also I have to counsel them in terms of these four classes of medication, that's a lot of medicine to start people on. And a lot of times people may be resistant to that. And so um, helping them to understand that I'm, I'm your team and, and we're doing this together and we have an objective that we're gonna get to and we're gonna do it however we can, but no matter what, I have your back. And so I think that process, laying that up down up front as a foundation that they know no matter what, Dr. Lucy's saying, this is gonna help me I'm going to try to make these changes and then to incorporate their families into it. It, Often my patients come with their loved one, their daughter, their grandkids. And then that becomes a household change that everyone's trying to get dad or get grandma to make that transition together. Chloe, as an advanced practice nurse, you're in New Orleans and people come to New Orleans just to eat high fat, high salt food. So how do you deal with that? Well, I encourage uh, moderation. So um, I encourage my patients to try to incorporate on a day-to-day basis, um, fresh fruits, vegetables, whole grains. And then when certain events or we have a lot of festivals here come up, then I tell them it's okay to have something that, you know, it's not, may not be the healthiest, but at least it gives them a variety in their diet. They're still able to incorporate their culture and and enjoy the festivals and all the different um, events that we have in our region. So that's that's what I encourage my patients. Oh yeah, I want to endorse that. I tell my patients, if you know something you're going to eat is not going to make you healthier, make sure it makes you really, really happy. Just (laughs) take a small amount. Kevin, you want to say something about that? I, I, I say the same thing. As a matter of fact, in my clinic uh, for my diabetic patients, I, I tell them I want them to have good control for 11 out of 12 months of the year, knowing that the corridor of time between Thanksgiving all the way into uh, the New Year's, uh, for most of us out that don't have Mardi Gras like I used to enjoy with you, Dr. Ferdinand, but uh, most people are not going to have the most optimal uh, diet during that time. It's a time of family. Um, at the time of it's a festive time, but yet at the same time, I tell them don't become the story um, at Christmas Day that you know you, Auntie uh, had a, a blood sugar of six hundred and had to go to everything that, that my colleagues uh, mentioned. Very good, uh, Carol. Statin, statin, statins. I agree with you. Here's a question came in from an anonymous attendee. What will help a patient who's having adverse reactions to all statins? So um, um, time, attention, and counseling. So um, in our lipid clinic, uh, probably a third of our referrals are for statin intolerance of some sort. So we spend a lot of time talking about what that means, what the symptoms are, how life-altering they are. And we have found that almost all patients can tolerate some dose of some statin. So we switch statins, we go to alternate uh, dosing schedules every other day, twice a week, once a week, whatever they can take. We go to alternate dosing regimens, cutting pills in half and quarters, because everyone we think should be able to get on some dose of some statin. Uh, Kevin, I'm gonna let you answer that also, because I know you're interested in the statin intolerant patients, but let me just follow up on one with uh, Carol on that. I know that there are some reported uh, peer-reviewed literature reports that alternative day statins may be better tolerated, but that's not in the label and that's not how the trials were done, Carol. This is true. It is not in the label and it is not how the trials were done. But there have been several studies that have shown the LDL lowering efficacy of these alternate dosing strategies. Um, So that does work, but there are no outcomes trials. You are correct. 
but um, I was one of the authors of the 2013 cholesterol guidelines, and we said get the patient on the appropriate intensity of statin therapy for the maximum tolerated dose. So Thank don't you. give up. Just keep trying. All right, Kevin, statin intolerant patients, in fact, they will come to the pharmacist and they'll say, this patient, the, this doctor gave me this medicine and I can't take it and he won't listen to me or she won't listen to me. What do you tell them? Well, I think number one, we have to make sure that they're not having any medication interactions that may be leading to uh, what we would call a higher under the area curve or higher exposure of those medications uh, that will cause muscular problems or other problems. That's number one. Um, because as I mentioned in, during my talk, uh, once you look at the lipophilicity of many of the statins and only one really and truly has black box warnings uh, for drug interactions, that being simvastatin, which happens to be the most lipophilic of all of them having much more muscle involvement. After that, uh, one thing I have recommended, and I know uh, Dr. Watson and I have, you know, briefly in the past, you know, kind of talked about it, um, uh, I do believe uh, trying, you know, giving a trial of, of what I call fairly high dose uh, coenzyme Q10, um, because anecdotally, we've had some pretty good success with it. And uh, during in the literature, it tends to be a little bit mixed back and forth, whether or not it really and truly does work. Um, but I've had success with that. And so, and, and plus it's a, it's a, a, a area where people have very little harm. Very good. I, I, would, I would endorse that. So um, in smaller studies using lower dose, and most people use about 200 milligrams per day of coenzyme Q10, they found mixed bag results. But in meta-analysis, they have seen a reduction in muscular symptoms with doses that usually are a bit higher. And uh, just as Kevin said, there's just really very little harm. So, and I, I let people know, this is not gonna make you live longer or make anything bad not happen, but it could help you feel better. So if you want to try this, go ahead and try it. Carol, the biggest side effect is bankruptcy from, uh, for coenzyme Q10, by the way. It's very expensive. Right, it is. We have a lot of powerful women on this panel from all parts of the country. And by the way, the geographic diversity is impressive all the way from the East Coast to the West Coast to the South Central over to Florida and New Orleans. But by the way, one of the questions is a big one. And the reason I mentioned women, because it directs directly at women, of course, the males on the panel, you can speak up also. How do we bridge the gap with women having worse outcomes? You actually know there are more women with heart disease than men. People don't recognize that. Is it more education for the patients, the providers, or the caregivers? Say, but I'll let you go first and then Anyone else, regardless of your sex agenda, can speak to that issue. Um, this this is a huge issue, and this is one that tugs at, at my heart, especially for Black women and outcomes for heart failure. Um, I think one is certainly education of providers and uh, recognizing the multiplicity in which symptoms present. This is something that is being taught, in, you know, in the medical schools, but I still think that we have some uh, gaps to overcome in terms of provider understanding there. I think um, women have become tremendous advocates, and that's an avenue that we are continuing to um, pursue in terms of female patients, knowing how to advocate for themselves, but also as we've increased the ranks of female physicians and advanced practice providers, I think that is also helping to bridge this gap. So education certainly is a tremendous part of it. I'll pass it on to my colleagues. Chloe or... Carol, you want to speak to how we can bridge the gap? I, the, I, I agree completely uh, with what Dr. Lucy says. It's um, a lot of it is education. And when you look at the epidemiology of what has happened to heart disease in women, um, a lot of things didn't move the needle at all. But what really caused a reduction was when we started these wide scale educational programs. So we let providers know, we let patients know. What are your risks? Because when you pay attention to them, just as many of the presenters have pointed out, people do better. If you do the right things, people do better. So I think education is a huge part of it. And 10 times more women die from heart disease than breast cancer. Breast cancer is especially an important About 13 area. About 13 times. 13 times. So breast cancer, I'm not dismissing it at all, but I don't think most people in our society recognize that what really 
has the leading mortality in women is heart disease. Chloe, you're a young lady. You want to speak to how you can address the identification of some of these gaps of recognizing and treating heart disease in women? I echo what was mentioned before about um, education for providers and patients, also um, improving awareness. Another area that I think that it's really important is the development of cardiovascular clinics that focus on women. I Very good. To bridge the gap. Columbus, there's a lot of pushback about vegetarianism in the black community. They said that it's very hard to get African-Americans to embrace this type of diet. You already answered the one, I'm gonna give you a chance. Maybe your first answer didn't cut it. How do you get patients who are used to eating low on the hog and fried everything to embrace your diet? Yeah, well, first I wanna just kind of acknowledge what was said as I'm not a woman, but I am a father of a 16 year old. And I think that when we kind of tackle the younger age is important from a foundational standpoint. As we all are aware, the cardiovascular events or cardiovascular disease really begins and propagates from the youth all the way on. So I think we have to tackle that. And that really serves to the point of our, our community, right? I think we, we're seeing, I think it's a misnomer that people of African descent are not embracing a vegan or vegetarian lifestyle. One of the fastest growing populations inside of the plant-based movement are the African-American community. And I think that really what ends up happening is looking once again at the, the components, focusing on what individuals are eating for their health. The honest truth is patients don't wanna take medications. Patients don't like coming to doctors. They don't like procedures that we do, but they do it, why? Because they're not feeling well. And so they're so used to feeling sick and feeling poor and they do it because they wanna feel better. And so I approach them very similarly as it relates to the nutrition. I don't tell them to change their lifestyle forever. So let's put you on a very intentional program for eight weeks, for 12 weeks, comparable to cardiac rehab program. And we're going to focus on addition as opposed to subtraction. And as we begin that process, if you feel better, you decide if you stay on it or if you don't. Um, and so that, that's one of my approaches that, that's there. It's not to negate, but to focus on the resiliency as opposed to the historical components of eating low on the hog. You know, we want to move away from that. And you know, Columbus, Actually, I made that dichotomy only to stimulate discussion, but medication and diet go together. If you eat a high sodium diet, you blunt some of the effects of the diuretic of the, the ACE inhibitor or ARB, because now it, they're working against what they're trying to do. They're trying to get rid of the excess salt. You say, no, I'm going to eat more salt. So the medication does not have the same benefit. You would agree with that? Absolutely. And I think there's there's uh, increasing studies. Jack did a wonderful review on the impact of psyllium in terms of the entire cardiovascular system, not just on fluid retention, but on the endothelium. And we look at the damage that ensues as a result. Allowing patients to understand that becomes important. Kevin, do you want to say anything about women and, and heart disease? Everyone else spoke to it. I don't want it to be seen that you don't care. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I care. Um, you know, uh, I would have, I think women are far there with their health and men overall. You know, sometimes I think our Y chromosome gets in the way and, and, and so they are much more likely to go and seek help. They are much more likely, I believe, to, uh, to, to uh, report things. And so when we have the uh, disparities and outcomes that we have, um, I think education uh, is gonna go much further uh, with women and hopefully will drive much more of the household of what they do. I want to address one thing that my good my colleague said. Um, I think you know very often across the country, people are often looking for medication uh, to you know they say, well, we don't want to take medication. I think people want the magic pill at all times. And one thing that we have to do as pharmacists and we have to work harder at is making sure that we're addressing the full health of a, of a, of a patient. When it comes to diet, exercise, lifestyle management, alcohol reduction, and other components, and not simply relying upon the medication to fix a problem according to numbers. And, and that's definitely something that we're teaching readily in our program right now. There's an overarching question that is related to the access to medicines. They actually asked about PCSK9 prescriptions. Can we do something to address as clinicians to improve that? Kevin, I'll start with you since you are a pharmacist. 
and then we can anyone can jump in. Carol, I know I've heard you address access and what we can do to get patients medications. Yeah, you know, we have a, um, in, in the pharmacy that we manage here in Tampa, Florida, we have an extremely robust outreach directly to the companies and, and with other companies. Uh, we have to work harder to try and get people um, uh, eligible to receive a fairly expensive medication. I mean, and so, you know, part of the problem is hassle factor of just getting approval because most physicians' offices don't have the, the manpower to continue to go through the prior authorization process. And we need to work harder to make sure that we are a resource for physicians and for the patient to get through that process a little bit easier, even working on the back end with um, insurance companies and direct, directly with the pharmaceutical companies to get approval for it. I agree with Kevin. I mean, we've made the decision in this country that the insurers will control the access. So we have to work with the insurers. And um, just as Kevin said, we almost have 100% approval of PCSK9 inhibitors, but it is with the hassle, hassle factor that you can't believe. We have a full-time medical assistant that all she does is prior auths in our lipid clinic. And that's, again, what a lot of practices can't do. And they know that. So um, it's uh, finding the, you know, lipid clinics often have those kind of resources who can do that hassle factor for you because our, our patients deserve it. Chloe, I know you write for PCSK9 inhibitors. Maybe you can tell us what are some practical tips. And Sabra, after Chloe, you may not be as much into the PCSK9 inhibitors. I know you know how to use them, but the four drugs that you mentioned, one of them, the SGLT2 inhibitors, are just as expensive. So I'll get your perspectives on how you get access to that. Uh, Columbus, you can also come in with access. I know that you deal with all of these advanced medications, including the, the new oral anticoagulants, and even just getting access to have a procedure done. What are some of the tips you can give? Cody, let's start with you on PCSK9 inhibitors. Anything you want to talk about access, then we'll go to Sabra. She's going to talk about uh, heart failure medications, and Columbus, you can follow up with whatever you, you deem appropriate. Chloe? Yes, here at Tulane, we have an um, outpatient pharmacy that we use. They are extremely helpful with um, the prior authorization process. We unfortunately don't have the staff within the clinic to be able to um, help us with that, but that the pharmacist is very helpful and our patients get approval. So it's very, it's that, very That's good. interesting. I, I I've I've seen you do this. You actually know the pharmacist by her first name and can talk directly to her. Is that correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. She's very helpful. All right, Kevin, uh, I was going to go to Sarah next, but you think that would be good that physicians and other clinicians get to know their pharmacists? Oh, absolutely. You know, I'm a big fan of that. Uh, something I work on uh, diligently here in the state of Florida that should be done all over the country. Uh, you know, we have to make sure that we are a valued resource for our physicians to help the physicians meet the outcome that they need as we move to a value-based, uh, more value-based care system. So I, I agree with that completely. And, and I would encourage all of the nurses and nurse practitioners on here to also get to know your pharmacist uh, extremely well, because uh, at the end of the day, uh, we're here to help you meet your goal for your patient and the way that you're going to be reimbursed in the future. All right, Sabra, I challenge you in terms of not necessarily PCSK9 inhibitors. You can speak to that if you desire, but the SGLT2 inhibitors, they're just as expensive. They are, and I will um, echo what Dr. Watson said. So what I do in my practice is when I see my patients and I decide, okay, I'm gonna need to start you on um, an ARNI, which often re requires um, prior authorization, sucubitral valsartan, or an SGLT2 inhibitor, or both, which also requires a prior authorization, I directly put my patient in contact with an RN for our heart failure group who works with them very closely over the process of about two weeks, going through all the paperwork for prior auth. And if we're not um, able to get it immediately covered up front, then we may have to go through a patient assistance program application. And so that first two weeks, I tell my patients, you have to be readily contactable. Um, we're gonna try to get this through for you. We've had a lot of success with the ARNI complex. The SGLT2 inhibitors were having more success with getting them, but they are expensive for patients who have had coverage for them. However, they are getting um, copay cards for the ARNI complex and then some co 
copay cards are, are coming up for the SGLT2 inhibitors as well. So I've, I've seen a lot of success. I haven't had that many turndowns for the SGLT2 inhibitors, but it requires a lot of diligence on the back end from the medical team. Columbus, any tips that you can give our audience in terms of getting around some of these access issues? And it doesn't just have to be SGLT2 inhibitors of PCSK9. That's what we started with. But anything that sure. you know has had a barrier that you've overcome. Well, I think the biggest way that you can bypass a lot of this is you join a wonderful med group like mine in, in Kaiser Permanente. And you're oh, able we to can't do that. We can't do that. Uh, <laughs> I know. But when you, when you do that, you can circumvent an awful lot. So in terms of there are there is a cost. I mean, we understand that this is raising the cost in terms of the healthcare expenditure inside the uh, United States generally, but we're able to do it. And so there is a system in, in our organization where we're tracking in terms of our cost expenditure and trying to negotiate with these companies. But I am able to prescribe it depending upon the member's insurance or what type of plan they have, they may incur some of those costs that then requires additional assistance to our social services. In terms of procedures and things of that nature, um, our limitation for us within my, my utopian situation is more of just access than it is capability. And for those um, situations where we're unable to provide those services, we contract with UCLA where Dr. Watson is or other um, sor uh, centers in order to provide that care there. I do want to throw one last thing in there is I think what's important is uh, when we look in general about lifestyle and these medications and I'll turn to lifestyle is that for years, doctors said that they were not going to tell patients not to smoke, quit smoking as doctors smoke, because the sentiment was that patients would not do it because it was too hard. It was ingrained in the culture. That was something they would never consider. And we know now that that's a fallacy. And so I think we have to take the same approach when it comes to that to really go upstream with some of the lifestyle components so we don't, we need less of this, but we're going, I'm, I'm not going out, going to be out of a job in terms of stents or having to use RNAs or having to use SGL2s. That's going to continue to be part of my practice. And so that's why this is an important conversation. Columbus, I will tell you that, unfortunately, I, I've been on the inside with the big discussions in Washington, D.C. about foods in our particular society. At one point, the Department of Health and Human Services was going to consider changing the sodium load and the saturated fat load in all federally supplied foods. And he said, so what? You don't eat federally supplied foods. Yes, you do. 60% of food sources in the United States are school lunches, the military food assistance, Medicaid or food stamps, whatever you want to call it. The federal government has a great impact on the foods that are available to be eaten in the United States. But you know what happened? We had a, a big meeting. There was gonna be an announcement. Uh, I'm not gonna give you the name of the person. And by the next day, it changed and kind of disappeared into everybody should eat healthy and live right. The change wasn't yeah. made, it's rough. I got two big questions here and they're kind of uh, overarching. It's related again to the premature death that we've seen. Carol and I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago. The heart disease rates went down, they plateaued, but now there's a little uptick that's happening. What can we do to stop this, Carol? And, and Sabra, in heart failure, we also seen that uptick. Now, it's, age is a possibility for heart failure, but it's not just age. Even in younger persons, especially in disadvantaged communities, you're seeing an uptick in heart failure. Carol, I'll let you go first. We know yeah. about the plateau, but now it's getting a little worse. Yeah, at what we've seen time and time again is every time we take our eye off any ball, it gets out of control. We took our eye off the obesity ball for a while. That got out of control, diabetes. We we're taking our eye off hypertension control. That's getting out of, that's driving a lot of the risks, especially in our community. People underestimate it. Oh, it's just a little elevation. It's just about five millimeters of mercury. It's not a big deal. It's a huge deal. It's driving the heart failure, the heart attack, so many things. So I think we just have to double down on everything. And I, uh, you know, obviously the advanced therapeutics, the you know, devices, the stents, et cetera, are important and have a role. But what's really important is what we eat how we control our risk factors, things like that. And I, you know, I agree completely with what, what Dr. Batista said. I mean, I don't, 
we are so used to telling patients what not to do. I try not to do that. I try to tell them what they can do. And I and admit that I do eat meat, but I am a meat minimalist. I don't eat a lot of meat. And so I'm saying, again, if you know what you're going to eat is not going to make you healthier, make sure it makes you really, really happy and just eat a little bit of it. Sarah, there's an uptick in heart failure. We know about the aging in our society, but this is divorced from the aging. There's been some increase in heart failure, especially in the Black community, heart failure hospitalizations. What's going on? Well, I think this does tie directly into the, the prevention issue. We know that heart failure is a, it's a trajectory, as I showed the stages of heart failure. And up front, yes, we have to do prevention. We have to do prevention much better than we're doing it right now. And that is blood pressure control, that is diet, that is exercise. Once we have patients with heart failure, we are not doing a great job as a, a medical community in terms of getting them on heart failure therapies. If you look at number of patients that are actually black patients who are actually on Arnie complex or hydralazine and nitrates, it's less than 20%. So the actual utilization of guideline directed medical therapy, once the diagnosis has been made is really not adequate. So I think it's twofold. Yes, we have to drive prevention, but for those who already have a diagnosis, there has to be an incredible push to overcome this therapeutic inertia to get folks on the right therapies. To have a 25% absolute risk reduction once a diagnosis of heart failure has been made on the right medications, that's, that's what's going to prevent someone from ending up in my office needing an LVAD or a transplant. And those are not the ways we wanna go. Even though those therapies, we use them when we need them, we wanna have to prevent ever having to get there. So overcoming therapeutic inertia and prevention. You know, uh, Sabra, it, it's a little bit worse than therapeutic inertia. It's buttoned right up against, I don't care about you as a patient. And I know you've had this experience. Carol, you can nod if you've had this experience. The person comes to clinic, uh, Chloe, you also. Blood pressure is 154 over 90. LDL is 130 something. And you say your LDL is up, your blood pressure. Oh, baby, it's been like that for years. The patient is almost taught that the disease is them. Have you had that experience, Carol? Sure. Or learned helplessness they have been taught that this is okay oh we've always been like this everyone in my family's like this not to mention everyone in your family had premature heart disease or stroke or something awful we can't do this i cannot tell you my blood boils the number of patients i'm referred or i pick up after someone has left whose blood pressure i look in the chart has been 140 to 150 every single visit for the last five years what? It's crazy. Why do we do that? Why, why do we allow that to happen? My personal uh, bias is that if we educate our patients, they can push these providers to do better, that they won't believe that because you're Black or because your daddy died at 44 of a heart attack, that's your lot in life. And some of the clinicians, I, I don't know, I'm not in their room, I can't see what they're thinking. But it might be that it takes time to sit down and talk and educate patients. It's easier to go from room to room to room, just writing prescriptions and giving follow-up appointments in three months. Yeah, I agree. And I think there is also a patient component as well, because patients, just as um, I forget who said it, but they don't really like to be on medication. So when they push back on it, it may be easier for some clinicians to say, okay, you're right. We'll just check it again next time. It's not easier. It's better to have that discussion about why I want you on this medication, why it's important, what the benefits will be, what maybe the side effects will be, but I need you to do better. So I need to have that discussion. So therapeutic <laughs> inertia is the term of art. Um, Chloe, Kevin, and Columbus, I know you've all seen it. What do you do to push back on it? And then after those uh, questions are answered, we're going to move into COVID and telehealth which is an area that unfortunately is still much upon us. Uh, let's go Kevin, Chloe, and Columbus, therapeutic inertia. What do you do with that, Kevin? Well, that, uh, again, I think one of the most important things is not only educating the patient, but from our standpoint, actually going out and communicating directly with the provider. And, and um, uh, that's been some of the most effective things I have. Now we have a closed system, not quite as closed as, um, as Kaiser, but, um, but once you find that happening, I think having educated providers along with the provider, I mean, the, uh, the patient, 
uh, along with an outside person like a pharmacist that's going to, because we get measured too on effectiveness of medications, but having a triangular communication pattern tends to be a very effective strategy for us. Chloe, therapeutic inertia. I agree with um, continuing education um, for providers. I have a lot of reps that come to me and want to meet. And although it is a challenge to find time, I tell them, you know, keep contacting me because the more I, I hear what you have to say, that, you know, it, it helps me grow as a clinician. And then my patients then benefit from me being able to prescribe those therapeutic agents. So I think that education is extremely important. Columbus? Yeah. I'm gonna chime in and say, I think it's relationships. You know, I think oftentimes I can countless number of patients who maybe haven't taken the medication because of a side effect they haven't wanted to bring forth or the fact that they don't feel their provider relates with them. And so they keep it hidden or a cost, the hidden cost. And so it's not filled. And so even in our closed integrative system, it can be at times a challenge to for a busy clinician to identify that this person has not really been refilling their meds as they should and very sporadically, which means implies they're not taking it. Um, so I think that that's extremely important is establishing that, that relationship for making success. Okay, the last round of questions, was well, one big question, but the last round of responses is related to telehealth and COVID-19. Patients, again, are somewhat concerned with coming into the clinic because they're gonna be exposed I know in California where Columbus and Carroll are, they did a wonderful job in vaccination, but there also was a large pool of people who weren't vaccinated. Now they're You're going back with a mass mandate because we're exploding in our numbers in LA County. Yeah. And and Chloe, New Orleans, Louisiana, we're just shameful. And Kevin, you ain't got nothing to talk about either. So <laughs> So let's see, let's, I'm, I'm gonna look at it as I see him on the top, I see Carol. Are you going back to telehealth? Or what are you gonna do in terms of keeping contact with your patients? And then we'll so, go, Chloe. Yeah, um, we are mostly back in person now, maybe 10, 15% telehealth now. And a lot of that is patients who really need to come in, I want them to come in. But there are a number of patients who don't need to come in right now and I can do telehealth, there's somewhat of a push from our system to get everyone in, but um, I encourage my patients who don't actually have to be seen to do it telehealth. Chloe, what's happening with you? I'm seeing most of my patients in person. Telehealth still is an option, although um, we have gotten information that reimbursement is a challenge. Um, now, but hopefully that may change. I would, I would hope so because we don't need to limit access to healthcare for any of our patients. They need to have every option available, especially in a time like this. I'm just looking at my screen. Uh, Columbus, then Kevin, then Sabra. Telehealth. What are you going to do? Telehealth. I'm a big pusher for telehealth. We actually use a tool, a physical examination tool for uh, for virtual physical exams. But we have really embraced bringing patients back in. And so in part, of that's because of just geographical distribution that we historically have utilized a degree of, of virtual care fairly successfully. And our, our reimbursement model is a little bit different than on the outside. Kevin, telehealth, I think you had some novel means that you developed before COVID. Absolutely. In our Department of Family Medicine, where I do my clinical practice, um, I'm, I'm probably at about 50-50 right now. Uh, telehealth um, by choice, by the way, I, I encourage it. What we need to do now is, is push much more in the way of, of telemedicine and, and get platforms going and open systems, not closed systems, where we really have much more uh, device wear out, in the, out, out there. So I'm, uh, I'm, I, may, uh, I may contact you all, Chloe, to, to hear more about the uh, Sphygma because I'm looking at all systems. I wasn't familiar with that, but we have to get much more involved, I think, in that space because to be honest, that is a space that we already know many African Americans, almost all of them have mobile phone usage, and we can turn it into a healthcare device. And I think we should do much more of it. But isn't, isn't Kevin some of that mobile phone just used to call the grandkids? They don't use it for internet or for health education. I know that. Well, that's exactly what we're working on right now. We can turn that into a healthcare device and get the insurance companies and others uh, to get much more data driven 
so that we can collect real-time biometric information about the usefulness and, and, and monitoring of medication effectiveness. And if it's not being managed appropriately, we can intervene much quicker, but we have to have much greater adoption to be able to get to that point. Sarah, you no, have and, and the just, last response. Oh, go ahead, Columbus, before we get to Sarah, go ahead. I was just gonna mention, you know, we did, we've done a whole lot of work in terms of our virtual cardiac rehab collaborating with Samsung. And so our innovation studio, uh, within our organization, we've taken care of 10,000 patients utilizing a wearable um, device in conjunction with an app for the phone. And so that's extended to a lot of different programs for blood pressure and for cholesterol and, and so forth. So there are a huge amounts of opportunity on the precipice for the medical community at large. All right, Sarah, but you have the last response and it's, you can do whatever you want, but the question was originally related to telehealth and what are you gonna do going forward? Oh, with regards to telehealth, so new patients, I, I new heart failure patients, I do want to see in person. And if they've just had a heart failure decompensation, I would rec recommend seeing folks in person. But once they're on stable heart failure therapy, I do encourage telehealth for us. You have to be within our state lines to do it. Out-of-state patients, um, unfortunately, still have to travel. Um, but I did want to make one other comment about Please. the uh, uh, previous, um, the therapeutic inertia. Um, so I do think this is something, it might be controversial, but I do think we have to put more on the providers in terms of um, objective outcomes for how we're doing. Um, and and we, we need to, to own up to if our heart failure patients are not being on the, the correct heart failure medications or if the blood pressure is not being controlled, the rubber has to meet the road somewhere because it's really impacting our community. So, Well, let me make two statements. I was a speaker, but I didn't respond to the questions. I mainly moderated. Uh, the white-black death gap has been described for decades. And at my stage in my career, I actually became at some point very despondent, like I wanted to quit, because I kept seeing these statistics where you had white, black, white men, black men, white women, black women. And that, that gap in life expectancy and more heart failure, more hypertension and more premature heart disease more heart failure, more end-stage renal disease, more chronic kidney disease on dialysis. It was just, I was getting tired. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm giving you direct personal feelings about watching this stuff go on for 30, 30 years. On the other hand, I am so pleased to have all of you, my young colleagues, who have the training, the expertise, the insight, and the drive to make a change. So hopefully, you can put a dent on this downward slide we're seeing in survival, this upward tick we're seeing in cardiovascular disease. And for our women colleagues and for our men who treat women, we need to stop sending women home saying it's your gallbladder or it's your nerves and start to take the women's symptoms seriously and looking at their risk factors and treating just intensively as we would the middle-aged man. So- One of the- um Statistics I saw recently, it's estimated that for 2020, the life expectancy for black men will be 68 years, 68 years. Think about that. Three years after you retire, after you get Medicaid, at your, at Medicare, you're now dying. I don't, it's, it's un... I, 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 my, my remarks were heartfelt. That wasn't an educational platform thing. I'm talking to you guys personally. And to the audience, you can hear our personal conversations because I know all of the providers that are on this, on this talk. It is, it's rough just watching this go on for year and year and year and watching these statistics. And then like you mentioned, uh, Carol, and uh, uh, Kevin, you may have had it in your presentation with COVID. It got worse because there was more mortality in the Black community. So the life white black death gap got bigger. So uh, y'all keep working and doing the right thing and trying to make a difference uh, because we can't go on for another 30 years like this. And I gotta say, Keith, you've been my mentor and my inspiration for years. And I think we're all gonna fight on in your footsteps. Here, here. Thank you, Carol. So I'd like to thank all the great faculty for the time they took out in their busy schedules to participate in this program. I'd like to thank the National Black Nurses Association for having us, the Association of Black Cardiologists, as part of their platform. The logout code for this session is F, like Frank, 550F50. One announcement from the Association of Black Cardiologists, we are pleased to have free membership and promotion to all of those who have attended this year's conference, go to the ABC virtual booth, 
take advantage of this offer. You don't have to be a cardiologist. You don't have to be black. You just have to be interested in reducing these terrible disparities that we have mentioned have been going on too long and join the ABC. The ABC is also offering COVID-19 innovation awards. If you're an ABC member and you're investigating solution folks mechanisms to aim at decreasing COVID-19 risk and cardiovascular risk, apply through the ABC, abcardio.org. This concludes today's program. The logout code is F50. Thank you all for joining and thank you my colleagues for continuing the fight. See you guys.